Gas masks and hand grenades. <laughs> hey, 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 what is happening, YouTube peeps? What is going on? It is Gas Mask and Hand Grenades here with you today. I am your host, Jeff, and today my guest is a founding member, vocalist, lyricist, and songwriter for one of the earliest death doom metal bands in the United States, hailing from the Windy City, Chicago. November's Doom has released 11 albums and one EP and have regularly toured the world, unleashing their crushingly heavy, melancholic, gothic metal to fans worldwide. Of course, I'm referring to the one, the only, Mr. Paul Kerr. Mr. Paul Kerr, how are you today, sir? I am very good. How are you, brother? What is happening? This is where we do that dance where we haven't already talked for five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, what's up? First time, first time. Um, no, but in, ser in all seriousness, this is the first time we're meeting. And I have to, this came together kind of weirdly because I reached out to you probably about, I don't know, a month ago, something like that. Yeah. And you never know, man. I mean, with the Instagram thing, a lot of rock stars, I use that term loosely, <laughs> rock stars, okay? Uh, some will respond, some will not, and some I have to go through promo companies, and some I don't. And I prefer to do the one to talk to the people that don't have the promo companies for a lot of good reasons. One being, we can develop a rapport, even if it takes a couple weeks to sort something out, which in our case didn't happen. It kind of happened almost like almost immediately, right? So yeah, yeah, which is super cool because then that doesn't give me too much time to get worried and overthink things and just, I got to go with my gut. Right. So, um, yeah. So I reached out to you, didn't hear back. I'm like, yeah, he's not interested. And then out of the blue, I get, Hey dude, sorry, I, I missed this. And I'm like, Oh fuck. Okay, cool. And so we got to talking and like it happened fast and I'm super stoked because as I explained to you before we went live, um, you are one of the foundational bands that I kind of built my death metal cred. If there is any, not there isn't any, but if there was any, the, the, you would be one of those bands. You you guys and Opeth, a few other bands that kind of like in that early stages for me were kind of my way to easing into death metal. And uh, the, the album that I eased into with, as I explained to you, was uh, was this one right here, which we're going to talk about in, okay. in detail in a little bit here soon. But um, so how are you doing, number one? I'll shut the hell up for a minute here. How are you doing? And. What's going on with you these days? Like just currently, what's what's happening? I'm doing okay. We just uh, we just got back. We were in Europe for uh, Prophecy. Prophecy Fest at uh, in Valve, Germany. That fest was incredible. That was uh, dude. That amazing. fucking that venue was insane, man. I uh, never what, was it a cave. Yeah, it was a a natural cave, and and it's like kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's it's an it's amazing. It was one of the uh, coolest like live experiences i think we've ever had it was great nice it was great. nice yeah and i know i was um don is don anderson is a buddy yeah. of mine and he's yeah, yeah. coming on at the end of the month we're going to talk about the agalog thing not allowed to go public too much with it yet until they do a they have a decibel feature coming up and he wants to wait till the end of the month but i actually mentioned i said hey i got paul kerman kirk coming on tomorrow he's like dude love that guy I ended up i was i was hanging out with him all uh all, all whatever was was it during the weekend or was it a during the week I, yeah it was a weekend fest yeah I, I we caught up with uh don and and all those guys and john and we haven't seen them in ages so it yeah, was, yeah. It was nice to catch up with everybody and you guys were label mates back in the day on the end records early yeah. on with um, yeah we were when they put and that was another foundational band that as i explained to you uh you know you guys were they were kind of one of my really early entries into black metal of course i knew about the norwegian first wave stuff with you know the the mayhem bullshit and everything yeah, yeah. Springs and stuff but it didn't really interest me very much and really agalot was kind of key in making me go okay there's something there's something here so um let me let me take you we'll get to prophecy prophecy fest here towards the end i want you to kind of go okay. into more detail but 
let's let's take you back. Let's take Paul Kerr back to young Paul Kerr. <laughs> that was and, a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> right, right. I know, dude. Like it's like you wake up one day and suddenly you're in your late fifties and you're pushing sixty and you're like, what the fuck happened? Like, where did my life where did my life go? And I mean, uh, it goes very fast. It goes very fast, especially when you have children, which I know you have a, a daughter, right? She turns 21 this month. So yeah, it's uh, crazy, it, right? Yeah. Crazy. It goes very quick. Yeah. My oldest <laughs> just turned 28 and my, my other daughter, my oldest daughter is 28. My, uh, my other daughter just turned 26. She's, she's a music nerd like me and loves nice. a lot of stuff I'm into. So she's getting into performing live and everything, which is super exciting. But, um, she doesn't live near me, unfortunately. She's down in Nashville, Asheville. So, mm. um, yeah, it goes fast. And and one day you just kind of wake up and you're like, holy shit. Like, what? Where did it all go? Like, yeah. It yeah. All go, right. Yep. So, but to take you back there a little bit, tell me about your first memories of music and how that mu how that early kind of exposure to music might have affected you. And, and by that, I mean, do you have any kind of special memories of like artists or bands or songs? You kind of came up like me. In the 70s, you're a little younger than me, but you were in that 70s, that golden era. Right. For me, that's a golden era of music. And, you know, Elton John and, you know, the the, the cool stuff of the 70s, right? All that AOR, right. the golden AOR stuff. So for me, I always kind of reference the fact that Beethoven's Fifth was the first thing I remember that. Dun, 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 mm -hmm. dun. And my dad, who's 83 now, was like an 83-year-old when he was like 20. So he was into like, like orchestra music and didn't like the current stuff, right? But my mom was into the the easy listening, you know, Bridge Over Troubled Water, Carol yeah. King, Tapestry, yeah. stuff like that. So that's kind of what I'm referencing. Tell me your reference points, your early reference points. Growing up in my house was was a little different. My parents um, were into nothing heavier in any way, shape, or form. It was it was country country and western at the time they call it um and my parents were into like oldies and uh doo-wop and and like all of that that kind of stuff um my dad later got into like andrea bocelli and, and things like that but my sister who's six years older than me <laughs> i love to say that um You're my age she's my <laughs> age. Mm -hmm. get to rib my older sister but the nice, beauty of having a a, a little older sister is yeah. she got into some of the cooler stuff earlier and I emulated that. So I remember very early uh, my sister getting into, cause I had a, a cousin around the same age who was into bands like ACDC and, and uh, Kiss and things like that. And my sister was, she really liked Kiss and had the 12 inch Migos and the- 100% the lunchbox and, and, and the, the notebooks. So I of course gravitated to the imagery. Um, she had the eight track cassettes. I remember listening. And I, I, so I remember my first, like, like, wow, my real awe into that was probably because of the, the look of, of kiss at a young impressionable age. I mean, I always wow. liked music. I liked ELO like on the radio and I loved uh, yes. the Beatles and I loved wings and growing up, all that stuff was, it's, it's just such a, because radio back in the seventies is all we had. It was so good. It was really no metal. So, right. Yeah. My foundation comes from a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, Genesis and Peter Gabriel and, and eighties, eighties pop music and things like that. And so, yeah, it, I, I didn't discover like true, metal in, until like my my middle school years and what were the, what were the bands that you remember kind of ca catching your interest at that point slayer was it slayer okay. i i went from like i i AOR heard that. slayer <laughs> i went from yeah I, I was like kiss iron maiden acdc like the harder rock uh easier metal and then and then i heard I heard Slayer for the first time and I was okay. like, holy crap. And that, I, then it led me to Metallica and it led me to, yeah, and then it just, that, that was it. I just, uh, balloon, balloon I went there, down yeah. that path and very early on listening to these bands and having influences there, there are, I, I knew I wanted to, I wanted to be a front man. I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to do that. I, I really, 
something about it drew me to it. And I, I wanted to do that, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So there's a lot did of experimenting. The, did you do the mirror thing? You know, the in the mirror <laughs> thing where you got the tunes jamming on the on the all in one, you know, you and I came from that era where you had the eight track and the fucking turntable and the, the stereo, right? All and in our, one, one unit, right? Mr. Fucking microphone. Exactly. <laughs> into a radio station. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, did you pick up an instrument at that point? At I played bass. Yeah, I played. I, I I was in guitar lessons when I was a kid. My, my parents had me in it. Uh, it never really stuck with me. Uh, I played bass for a while when we first, I was playing bass and singing. Um, and I, I was never good at it. Uh, it, it so yeah, it's just something, it was one of those things where it's like, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm never going to be able to put in the, the time into this that to truly do it justice. So I, I kinda, right, right. Yeah. I put that down and let that to the, uh, the better bass players than me to handle. <laughs> I mean, you spoke, you spoke of kiss and while you would have been probably five, six, seven years old when kiss was kind of like really huge right in the late the mid to late 70s yeah you know, yeah kiss, kiss alive i was 10 years i was 11 10 or 11 i was because i was born in 66 so right when kiss alive comes out i that's when i become aware of kiss yeah changed my whole life changed my whole fucking life man i mean i i was only a kiss fan from 76 to 80 i pretty much stopped after that I, you know i know some of the material after but i don't own it i'm just not into it but that was the band that had it not been for Kiss, I don't think I would have the love that I have for music and would have never would have never picked this up. And and you know, because Ace Fraley was my dude, and then it was yeah, then it, then it was Lifeson when I discovered Rush, everything was over at that point. You know what I mean? It was like nothing's gonna touch that. And nothing has touched it. That's still my band, right? But right. It, but being a 70s kid, I don't think a lot of people younger people now. They don't understand it because Kiss is like a joke band to most younger people that I talk to that are into metal. They're kind of like, yeah, they're yeah, they're they're bubblegum. And they are when you compare it to like where we're at now. But that was a foundational thing, man, for all of us kids in the 70s. I know they get knocked a lot even now uh, because was their songwriting ability incredibly complex? No, but that's not what it was about. It was about just good classic hooky rock and roll it's all dude, it was and dude, and they they on. nail it every time i mean god of thunder the riffs in god of thunder king right. of the nighttime world the riffs in that song fucking you know detroit rock city come on is there a cooler fucking set of riffs ever maybe i don't know it's i i understand there's a lot of people and i get it it, it might not be their cup of tea and they might not like what they're doing i'm that i'm that kind of person where uh, take like, okay, Jimi Hendrix, take Jimi Hendrix, for example. I am not a Jimi Hendrix fan. I don't, like, I, am, I don't I like his lie. music. I, I, I just, I, I'm not a fan of Jimi Hendrix. Right. Was Jimi Hendrix talented and absolutely incredible? 100%, 100%. That guy sure. had oozing talent. I just don't like what he was doing. It, it's not my thing. Just I don't not into it. it. Yeah, just right. not that, into that's it. all it is, man. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of bands like that that I'm like, hey, they're really good. I don't care for it. It's not my thing. I'm not going to put it on and right. listen to it. But, damn, they're they're talented. And right. Too many um, people are quick to dismiss bands like Kiss. Oh, they suck. They're not, they're not technical enough. It's like, no, they far from suck. <laughs> they far from suck, man. I mean, yeah. I don't think, I don't think until you start – to sit down and try to write songs, you can understand the complexity of creating something that is catchy that somebody wants to listen to again. That you know, let let for example, let's take a band like Yes and Tales of Topographic Oceans. That's as technical as it gets for the seventies, right? But is it really infinitely listenable? And I'm a huge Yes fanatic, but is it a is it an album I go back to often? Not very much. It's almost too it's too weird. In a lot yeah. of ways, too non palatable, uh, palatable, I guess is the word I'm looking for. But um, so you, you say you picked up the, the bass and the guitar as a young kid, or are you like middle school at this point, or where are you at? Uh, yeah, it was probably grammar school. Like I'm going, it's probably around, you know, fifth, sixth grade in, the, in that time frame. Yeah. What, what stuff do you play now? Do you play anything like which, which, with what you would call, 
enough proficiency to be you know that you could sit in on a jam session or something or or no 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 no, okay. no I'm, I, I'm not i'm not trying to out you or in any way no no just, hey man i i i'm the first one to admit i uh you're honest i have always why why has this worked for me because i have been lucky enough in my right career where i have been able to surround myself with phenomenal musicians yep and those guys make me look good so I, I give I give my band the credit. I mean I I've I've kind of like fumbled my way through this all along, and and I just surround myself with pros. And uh, yeah, but but your instrument is right here, Paul. I mean, and that's quite frankly one of the most difficult instruments to master because it's affected by everything. It, it's you know you, the way you treat your body, the way oh you, god yes, how much sleep you get, how much water you take, the food you eat, the the lifestyle you're living, you know, right. it's like this right here. If it's not working, it's not like you can fumble your way through a DGC chord progression. Kind of, if it's not working and you're not healthy, that's it. So, and you have an incredibly distinctive voice for the genre. I often say this, and I mean this truly, there's a million death metal vocalists out there. Right. And I, I think when Michael was at his peak, Michael Ockerfeld, when he was at his apex, I think he was the standard barrier. And you are literally like one slight notch right there below him. And I don't mean that as a diss no, to I, you. I appreciate that. I, I know I know uh, how talented Michael is. So I definitely uh, I take that as a compliment. Yeah, now he's, he struggles these days. Just age and he's kind of changed the way he sings quite a bit. He quit smoking, which I think did kind of affect... Mm -hmm. The overall thing but i still think you know his clean voice is one of the best you're ever going to hear in death metal for sure and that's where you stand out too because you're not just a a cookie monster guy you can do the cookie monsters better than a lot of a, a lot of dudes that do it but you have this really distinctive sort of smoky deep i don't even know are you a are you a tenor are you a a, a bass or what are you you have any i have idea? no idea no, no I have no idea. Maybe I, I'd say tenor. I don't know. I, I can, I'm probably not bass. I can't go quite that low. Right. Uh, I'm probably more like tenor. Yeah. I'm probably more in that range. And so let's, let's jump real quick into, um, did you have any other, you said you knew right then when you, you got into kiss and some ACDC and some of those formative bands of the seventies, did, did you know, did you have any other plans once you got through like high school about what you might do as a as a career versus being a musician and in a, in addition to that what was going on in high school for you to start to move in that direction where were you where were you heading as a budding artist this this is a, this is a good yeah this is a good question and i got a i got a good answer for you um i never planned on doing music as anything more than having fun with my friends. It was, it was never meant to be my career path, uh, was martial arts. That's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. That's what I was training for. That's what I was doing nine hours, 10 hours a day, every single day for years and years and years and years. And there wasn't a lot of time to put in to the band and the music I did once a week, but then my time was that's, I was going to open a school. That was what I was doing. And, uh, Life took a different path for me, and uh, when I developed my spine disease, that kind of took me out of the martial art dream. So it kind of filled more space for the music. And then I just leaned on uh, my, my graphic design and my artistic skills, and that's kind of what I did as my, uh, my basic career, my job. Yeah, as, as, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Because the band has always been, I mean, I, I, I tell this to people all the time. It's never been, we've never considered ourselves a, a, a professional band. And I mean that by professional band, earning an income from our music. Right. We, we've never earned income from our music. It, it, is, right. it, is, it is a huge glorified hobby, hobby that we, yeah. we sink money into because we love doing it. Um, which is 90% which is of most death metal bands because the genre does not support a massive amount of, Hugh Janik bands, right? I mean, Absolutely. even guys I would think like Entombed and 
some of these, you know, the Swedish bands that are like holy grails. I think like Opeth would be one of the bands you could go, oh, okay, that's a career band. They are right. professional bands. They're touring, you know, they're, they're doing album tour, album tour, album tour. You guys have never quite reached quite that level, which is, we'll get into that in a minute. I don't want to, I don't want to jump too far ahead. Um, but I've heard you speak about that and that's a difficult one, I'm sure for you, because I think that's where you ultimately wanted it to go, but things just haven't quite worked that way. So we'll get into that in a sec, but did you have any, did you start the band? Were you in high school when you started the band? Cause you started in 89. So how old were you? Yeah, it was, uh, See, that's when November's Doom officially started. The band itself started as years laceration. before that, like '85. Yeah, we we started we started in the earlier '80s, and it was a little bit different. So I started the band and the music earlier, and it became we we changed the name and the style, and and we kind of fell into our groove around '89. So yeah, it was. Um, I, I'm sorry, I trailed off. I'm, I. I forgot what the uh, the question was. Well, the question was, did, did you start, when did you start? So oh. actually you didn't start November's Doom until Laceration kind of morphed into. Uh, yeah, it was November the same Doom. band members at the time. We had, right. we had said, oh, let's, let's slow things down and let's tune down lower and let's let, and we, and we started to make kind of the shift from the more thrashy stuff to the, to the really doom death stuff. And then at yeah, that I'm not, point, I'm not going like, to lie. I don't know the Laceration stuff. I'm that's not okay. Nobody I know it. it's, but that's okay don't even look it up it's fine okay <laughs> oh it's one of those deals i got you, got you. Uh, i'm not really happy with it. i mean I, the music's great uh, but i you know i it's uh what, that's you, what truly, was your singing style at that point um very throaty very thrashy like james hetfieldy or tom Araya or um okay so Going back again, when I when I started to kind of find myself and what I I wanted to do vocally, um, some of my biggest influences come from Chicago bands that unfortunately were overlooked or because of mistakes of their own or whatever never never got the popularity that they deserved. But we had bands in Chicago at the time. Uh, gonna sneeze i apologize like, like cyanide or <laughs> oh i'm sorry sorry ah, no uh syndrome syndrome okay. and devastation oh syndrome yeah, yeah. devastation right syndrome and devastation are two bands from chicago devastation uh especially and so in my opinion the swedish death metal sound was invented in Chicago by one man, wow. okay, Irv, Irv Bodingen, the guitar player for Devastation. And I could back this up by, if you go look at, at the Gates, Carcass, all those bands, their first albums or even demos, they thank Devastation and Irv. They pulled so much influence from that guy. He's the first person that I ever knew that added that neoclassical kind of ripping sound to death metal and okay. it it just sparked this this uh a lot of people be like oh he's full of shit and he doesn't know what he's talking about hey man i don't care it's an opinion and i got it and i'm telling you <laughs> do some research look up devastation from chicago listen to earth then go look at all these bands that you think invented that sound and go research and see them all thank earth i'm gonna I'm check it out you. what's his name again earth Brottingen, Irv, E R V, Irv, Irvin. Okay. He's, is he still around? Uh, he's still around. He's not really doing music as far as I know. Okay. I, I talked to him a few years ago, but uh, well, yeah. I'll check that out, Paul. I'm definitely going to definitely check that do out, that, now. man. I, I, think, I think a lot of people would be surprised. But yes, so Troy and, and Dwayne, the two singers, uh, Dwayne from Devastation, Troy was also in Devastation, but I, I liked him better in Syndrome. They each had their own unique quality in vocal. Dwayne was much more guttural. Troy was more on the thrashy, heavier side, but his vocals were crystal clear. And I, I listened to the two of them and I went, man, I want that brutality with that clarity. I, if I'm going to have something to say, people should understand what I'm saying. So I worked very hard early on on 
enunciation and making sure that my growls were as heavy and as brutal as they can possibly be, but you being able to understand every word. And then I, I was hugely influenced by uh, like Peter Gabriel and mm. uh, Simon and Garfunkel and, and harmonies and melodies, but I, I was never a good singer. And then I heard like Russ from Forbidden. Uh, uh, forbidden mm. evil and he's he's oh. going from the the thrash and he's going into uh you know the the clean vocal passages of uh just man i i heard that stuff and i went i need to add like that kind of stuff into this kind of music and look i i'm the first one to say this we've been around a long time i consider november's doom to be we didn't invent anything I, sure, I'm sure, I, right. I'm not one of these people to like say, hey, man, if they, you're welcome for doom metal. No, that's ridiculous. That's yeah, right. Not, it, it would be right. It's, right. it's that we invented nothing. Right. We did find our own space within the genre that that we kind of like felt comfortable with, and I, I think we've contributed. I think uh, we have definitely influenced and contributed, and and I think we've earned our place as as. Uh, pioneers of the genre or at for least sure. in that first tier of bands coming through i know we got overlooked for a long time because i think yep. uh geography had a lot to do with that all eyes were on on the european side of things and not so much you know america or, especially or florida, Chicago, or florida or florida or new york florida new york had yep. all eyes yep. on them at the time and yep. they should have i mean bands were fantastic coming out of there but Absolutely. chicago got criminally overlooked there were some amazing bands that just never made it because the wrong Great band, wrong timing. Um, ben has a quick question here, Brain Smasher. Uh, slightly off topic, but I discovered Dead Serenade pre-November's Doom last weekend, and the, I'm not sure what the loss of Jerry means. You probably know what that means. Um, what a good demo. You want to speak to that real quick? Dead Serenade was a band from uh, uh, Indiana, north Northwest Indiana, that my guitar player now, Larry Roberts, he's been with me over 20 years, he was in Dead Serenade. And okay. at the time, there were only like a few doom metal bands in the area. So we we traded members a lot back and forth. Sure. And Jerry was a guitar player in Dead Serenade. He had joined us uh, right after Amid It's Hell and Mirth came out. And uh, we wrote like two or three songs with Jerry. And he uh, tragically died in a car accident. So oh. recently yeah. or what? No, no, no. no. We're, we're, we're going back a, a oh. long time. This was right okay. after our... This would yeah, I'm not. I'm not aware of that. I haven't heard of that. So Ben, Ben just had a question about that. Um, yeah, Johnny, what, Johnny, what's up? Lapsdown, what's up? He says brutality and clarity sums up November's doom nicely. Very neat to hear about the premeditated, how premeditated the sound was. And uh, my buddy Devin here, he saw you at MDF, which, by the way, I've not seen you guys live. Been a fan since 2002 mm -hmm. or whatever, but I've never seen you live because it's either worked out that I find out. After you played somewhere close, I'm near, I'm near Philly and Baltimore. I'm about an hour, hour and a half out from both those places. Okay. And every fucking time I've learned about you doing something, it was after it already happened. Or in the case of MDF last year, or la no, not last. Was that last year? No, 2022. Yeah. Uh, yeah 22. Right? Yeah, 22. Um, yeah, because they have a year off. They took right, a year, they a year off. off. Yes. So um, we were the last I, one. I was stoked to come down. Because I'm buddies with Kelly from Atheist. I was stoked to see them for the first time. And, you know, all a, a B.I., Blood Incantation. with so many killer, killer fucking bands on that on that uh, thing. Are you on this year? I, I'm not. I don't know. Do no. You, you're not? Okay. No. Which is a bummer because there's some monster bands playing this one, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Atheist is there. Forbidden's come back. You know, that's killer. Craig yeah, and I are absolutely. good buddies. So, yeah. Um, but I haven't gotten to see you last last MDF. All my YouTube buddies came in, and it was because of my condition we spoke about earlier. I was a little scared to be around a lot of people that maybe the COVID thing wasn't far enough away in Got my it. mind to make yep. the trip. And so I decided not to come down, which I'm now kind of kicking myself in the ass for. I wish I had. But um, uh, so w when, when you start, w when things trans form from laceration into November's doom. There's a concerted thought process that we're going to, we're going to slow everything down. We're going to tune down. We're going to do brutally crushing death. And then we're going to juxtapose it with these kind of Gothic cleans 
Um, how did things lead to to this? How did things lead to this album? And also, what kind of influences are you now? What's kind of the driving force in terms of influencing you guys as far as songwriting? Because no matter what any guy says, oh, we we created this thought, this sound we wanted to hear. You're always inundated with the things that you're listening to and the things that you're you're into at the time, right? So what's oh, happened yeah. for you at that point in time? So as as we're evolving, that first album, it it, it was. Yeah, so the, so the big influences coming out of that were I, I know my guitar player Steve and and he was really really into like Sabbath and 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 the seventies uh, right. doom rock and roll. So I know, man, that this that's so hard to to say because I didn't write the music, so right. I'm I'm trying to get in the head of the guy who did. Um, I mean, you hear a lot of Sabbath, you hear. Trouble, late trouble, the oh, seventh trouble. Yeah, yeah. You hear a lot of Saint Vitus. I mean, it's that that doomy, slow, dirgy thing that's going on. And your vocals are definitely changed from the early days to to where you're at now. And I mean, there's a difference for sure. I think I've gained a lot more confidence. Oh, for the sure. Years. Yes. Uh, I've never taken a singing lesson in my life, and I still to this day don't think I know how to sing. I, I just uh, I wing it, and I'm. I'm glad I'm not completely tone deaf. I can kind of pull it off. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I tell you, man, I, I for a lot of my career, I felt like a fraud. I, I really have because really? I, again, oh God, yes. I, I, I have such talented musicians around me and I, I can't play an instrument. I, I don't really know how to sing. I, I, you know, it's just something that I wanted to do. I started doing it. Uh, People seem to enjoy it, and I just kept it going. Um, I am not as talented as these other guys, and and I I find it amazing that there are people that can put me on on like because I can listen to like other musicians like your Michael Ackerfelds and other people that are in the same genre, and I go, oh man, man, I I really got to like up my game that that the quality level of of certain things. So I'm always like. And I think that might be a good thing for November's Doom because I think a lot of us in the band are, are kind of similar in this way. We're always chasing better. We're always chasing right. uh, perfection, which we know doesn't exist. But Trying but to up your game. Every time. time. Yeah. And I think that's one of those things I think you can never say about November's Doom other than possibly one in our catalog that I can think of. We have tried to do something different album to album to album and never 100% repeat ourselves. We try to challenge ourselves with every album. I know that gets difficult. And as the years go on, everything sure. kind of starts to come together. But I mean, we can have songs like Rain, which is just straight up death metal heavy. And then we can have songs like uh, What We Become, which is a complete clean ballad. And for some reason, they both sound like November's Doom. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, even though well, they're, they're essentially different styles of music, I think, you we, know what, you know what the, you know what the common thread there is, Paul, it is the, the fraud at the vocalist position. I, I do. I do understand that. And, understand and trust what me, I'm saying, that, I mean, without you, it's not going to sound like November's doom. I, I, I mean, there are bands that can kind of transform you know, you look at like an ACDC where they lose Bond and they bring in Brian. But it's kind of, in my opinion, it's a different band. I've never been a big ACDC fan. But like another real clear example is like Allison Chains. You lose a, a, a fucking legendary vocalist like Lane and you go away for a long, long time. And then you come back with William. And I was skeptical as fuck, man. I was like, this is not going to work. There's no way, man. Have to say it's different. But it's not because Jerry was kind of doing – Jerry, to me, was kind of the glue of that band in many ways, is oh, the glue. And, and so re realistically, when when William came in, it, it was slightly different, but it works. But it is different. But I think if they if you suddenly exited the picture, it just wouldn't – it wouldn't be the same band, clearly. 
And so when you say you're a fraud, I get what you're saying. You're saying that to an extent, kind of tongue in cheek in a lot of ways that, you know, you've kind of, as you said, you've surrounded yourself with better players. Ke Kelly Schaefer says that all the time. He's like, dude, I'm the least talented guy in my band. Like, no doubt about it. Absolutely. I feel the same way. But without you, without Kelly, it isn't the same. And I'll tell you the main reason why, not even just your vocals. It's your drive. It's your drive to keep forging ahead with November's Doom. Without that dude, I don't think it happens. I know Vito is a big part of the writing process. And Larry, those guys have been there a long, long time now. And they maybe are the riff guys that kind of create the, the soup that you swim in. But without you, man, I I don't think November's I think November's Doom kind of dies if you if you go away. So Pat yourself on the back for that, dude. I, I think you I, should take that as the reality of what it is. Devin says, of all the bands that played MDF, you sounded the closest to the albums. So I don't agree about you guys being a fraud. So, well, that's because they were just playing tracks. It wasn't live, Devin. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, our back, we do have we have our, our keys and stuff on backing tracks. And and so that means we have to play to the right. click you to the album. The album. Which yep. is why, like everything, is always sounds like the album. We're not rushing anything. We can't. We have to stay in the pocket. Sure. So, uh, sure, sure. yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. That's uh, we we try to sound as much like the album as we possibly can. Yeah, I, I just uh, I I get what you're saying. I appreciate what you're saying. But I look at bands like like uh, uh, take Opeth for example. Would November's Doom have have been reached? opeth levels if they had uh, like michael or or a talent like michael in my position instead of me <laughs> maybe maybe i'm the reason that the band never got there see what i mean it's like yeah I, when i can listen to these other guys and i know how good my band is i know how good my guys are and right. i go man why the music that these guys are creating is so good on par if not better than some of this stuff why why has it not reached that level could be me. Well, I think you, I, you know, I, I, I think you, you, I think you nailed it though. I think regionally that's a bit of an issue. You're not in one of the major cities that you can be exposed to playing a lot. Not that Chicago is not a, a small place, but it's not right. really known as like a Mecca for music as far it, it's a jazz town and blues. Yeah. 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 We're a Absolutely. Blues town, right. It's a blues right, town. Right. Right. So, uh, and I love Chicago. I've been out there many times. It's a fucking awesome city. Um, but it's just not known as like a mecca for death metal. And as you say, the European, and I think it kind of answers one thing, a question I had later for you, but we'll tackle it now is that your profile is much larger in Europe than it is in the States. That is, that and, is definitely true. And that's not unusual for a lot of metal bands in the United States, right? It, you know, there was LA, which had the hair thing, the glam thing. There was yeah. Seattle, which had the grunge thing. And New York's kind of a hodgepodge of everything, right? But there's not – the USA is weird because it's so damn big and so expansive and so fickle in many ways that you can't – a scene doesn't develop as easily and nurture itself and grow like I think it does in the UK where it's much more condensed or in centralized Europe where it's much more condensed. You can get to numerous countries, Germany, Belgium, France – Italy, absolutely, all, absolutely. Right. So you have all that, all this stuff is traveling. Like in the US, it's just much more disparate, right? And I think that's one of the main reasons. I will say this, and I'm going to ask this now because it's, I, I probably was going to ask it a little later, but I'm going to ask it now. We brought up Opeth a number of times. In the press, particularly when you guys started to ascend and be more of a known quantity, mm -hmm. there was kind of a, always that, oh, these guys sound like Opeth. Oh, these guys, they remind me of Opeth. Do you, do you, are you, you're aware of that, of course, right? Of course. Okay. So talk, speak a little bit to that. Um, we brought up Michael a number of times and I just want to say Michael's a rare, 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 rare gem in music. I mean, the dude is multi faceted. He plays guitar insanely good. He plays keys. He's a writer. He's a singer. He's an arranger. He's just a unique animal in unto mm -hmm. death metal. He's like, Ivar Bjornsson or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. Those guys don't come along that often. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about the Opeth thing. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. 
well, we know those guys. We know them quite well. We've we've uh, we've played several times with them back in the day. We we did a, a short run with them at Amorphous. Uh, yeah, I know I know Michael very well. Um, well, I mean, I I don't. I'm, am I upset with comparisons? No, I, I think comparisons are fine. They help people that are a fan of one band possibly discover another band. What what I find more offensive are the people that say things as fact without doing research or homework. Like, oh, this American band sounds like Opeth. They must completely be influenced by Opeth. Yeah. Um, we were a band first. <laughs> Well, not only uh, that, you have sound nothing like the early Opeth. The early I, Opeth is almost black metal compared to your super Sabbathy, slow, dirgy, gothic sort of thing. Nothing like it at all. By the time everything got to that point. See, here, here's the thing that I think most people don't realize. And that is, look at the age of myself and my guitar player, Larry, and the age of Mike Ackerfeld. And look, look, we all came up and we're talking Anathema, Catatonia, My Dying Bride. All of us Paradise bands Law, are yeah. about the same age. Right. We all came up listening to the same things and drawing from the same influences. Well, Pink yeah. Floyd, Black Sabbath. We all drew from the same well. So of course, it's all going to kind of sound similar, but you right. can't sit there. I'll, I'll read. I've read things in the past where I'll read people uh, reviews of an album and it'll be like, Oh, November's doom. It sounds just like Opeth Moonspell, and catatonia. I'm like, none of those bands sound anything alike. So which one is it? Well, <laughs> not like, only this that, is just it, lazy. But not only that, what about let's turn it. What about the new Opeth sounding like November's Doom, Paradise Lost, My Dying Bride, blah, blah, blah. It's like, like you said, the soup but was that, all that, there. That'll never happen. Right. It, what once, once you reach that level, you can rip off everybody and it won't matter anymore. Everyone is going to call you the best, the, the originator. The, they're, they're the gonna, innovator, yeah. We yeah. live in that time and that world where... People will defend opinion as fact. And if your opinion is different than my opinion, fuck you. It's like, oh, dude, man, that, that's, that's not how music get into works, politics, dude. But we're living, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that. that nightmare right now in this country. Bad, right? I, you, know I, I, you know what I'm talking about. Our, our country's a mess. Yes, it's it fucking, is. It's yes, a it fucking is. nightmare, it's, dude. And you um, know what? It's a mess on both sides. It's a fucking I mean, mess. I agree. I agree. Oh, I'm my not, God. I'm not siding one one way or the other, although I lean far more left than I do right. So um, I stand right in the middle, man. I I um I just want what's best for for you know fucking for people. all of us all <laughs> people. Of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that I'm glad you said that because you know one thing that you know back in the day, the zine was the thing. The magazine you maybe oh, yeah. got in you know brave words or you got in rip uh, not rip. Um, Kerrang, or you get in terrorizer you know, metal maniacs metal maniacs all those yeah. things, right sure so and i'm buddies with marty i don't know if you know marty worm do you know marty from uh, metal maniacs Jeff uh, Wagner, I, i'm guys. sure yeah i'm sure i've run across him at times yeah. um I'm, I'm, I'm not friends with jeff i don't know him but i know marty quite well and so um you know the problem with being and now what what i'm doing what we're doing uh, as a YouTube community in the metal thing is we've kind of replaced the zine, right? Cause the, right, the print right. medium's kind of gone. So now it's guys like me that have opinions, but I can play, I can, I can actually play an instrument and I can write a song and I played in bands. So I feel like my opinions are a little more legitimate, but, but no less valid or more valid than any other dude. I just want to, you're in a position now where you're actually putting effort into this. My my beef goes back, I guess, to the zine days where there was a time. I don't know how it was everywhere. I can only speak for for like the Chicago area. Sure, you couldn't go to a local show without somebody or or everybody in that audience has to be a part of it somehow. Right. I have I have my own zine that they would make twenty five copies in Xerox and staple and hand out. 
And yeah. why did they do that? Because they got free CDs from like constantly from all these labels because they yep. wanted the promotion. Did yep. any of them actually sit down and review the album? No. So, so you get what we've worked on for possibly two to three years of, of constant writing, rewriting, and writing, re yep. and they dismiss it within seconds because they just yeah. wanted something free and, and they're, they're, you know, mm, that can so get just, frustrating just, as a musician. Just a disclaimer. I do not get free CDs. I, I buy my shit. And if you look behind me, that's no, the stack. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at any no, individual, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying, shit, man, man. I'm, a, I'm old school. I do not, I, I do not like the download thing. The only thing that I like about Spotify slash YouTube or whatever is I can immediately stream something and then go buy it. Okay. That's, that's my thing. Um, but, and also the other thing, and one thing I noticed with the whole YouTube community is that albums come out on Friday and man, by Saturday or Sunday, some dudes posting some review of it and you're like, how the fuck can you possibly, how can you possibly have any kind of an informed, that's why I do not do reviews on my site. If you look at any of my material, Paul, it is deep dives with catalogs that I've spent many hours with. It's yeah, that's awesome. with the artists. I, I do not do that quick judgment thing because a lot of my favorite albums grew on me over time. Some of them I was like, yes, this, yes, this is fucking, this is fucking trash. And so I'll give you a good example. Matter of Life and Death by Iron Maiden. Thought it was just a total shit show. It's now one of my favorite albums. It's definitely one, my probably my favorite post Bruce's return because I sat with it for many many months, going, "All right, there's something here that keeps drawing me back in." And that's that's what I want to do. I want to hear. Yes. Another great example. Stephen Wilson just came out with his new album on Friday. His last two albums. And Steve and I were buddies at one point in time, quite good buddies. Um. I thought his last two albums sucked, man. Didn't like them. Don't like them at all. Kind of made it known that it just seemed lazy to me. His new one, I've I've listened to it four times in a row because I had to because something made me go back and go. You got to re-listen to that. That's good. And right now it's probably a nine out of ten, man. I'm like, wow, this, I didn't expect this. It's pretty killer. So that's kind of you know just to explain my little niche in this thing, and it's a small little niche. It's growing, but it's a small niche. I want to bring on guys like you that need a voice to, you're not just going to, unless you start your own podcast, you're not just going to get on the internet and go, yeah, my name is Paul Kerr and I'm in this metal band. And so you guys should check me out because I'm a fraud, but you know, the rest of my guys are great. And here's why I need to listen to the band. You see what I mean? You're not going to do that. So I want to bring you on and, and ask, ask the tough questions. So the Opeth thing, we kind of, kind of push that past and i think that's great what i wanted to note too was um and i guess i have one of the original versions i have the oh yeah martyr, it is i can see by the cover yeah martyr M music group yep i designed that that's yeah i i uh that's that's the original okay so which is interesting because i looked at the newer one and yeah. it's got a dude in a gas mask on it and i was like oh cool but yeah these are bought so you know i bought these back in the the very oh, yeah. early 2000s which is awesome um but i want to ask you about now this album changes tack a little bit mm -hmm. uh you start to accelerate the speed a little bit but you get a little bit more gothic on this in terms of there's there's violin on this there's uh cello there's a, some really interesting female vocals on it what what are you thinking there what's going on there with with that album well at that point, uh, Steve, the original guitar player that I started November's Doom with, he had made his uh, exit. And we, before he left, we had uh, brought in uh, Eric Burnley as the guitar player. Right. And after Eric came in, that's when Steve had said, all right, I think I, think I found you know, who, can, who can replace me and I'm, I'm going to bow out. So he had left. Now, Eric... Eric came from a background where he was one of those kids. He was self-taught on guitar and um, wasn't in band. So in his room, he tuned the guitar differently. And to play these, these like crazy chords to make it sound fuller like two guitars. Okay. Uh, and he was writing more of a black metal sort of style. So 
Eric's influence and the way he played and he tuned that down and the chords he was writing. Like when we brought Larry in as a second guitar player and Eric's like, uh, you're, you're going to have to learn how to play like this. So we've like <laughs> fucked up everybody that's come right. in. Um, the guys have kind of straightened it out a little bit more since then, but yeah. So Eric's black metal influence that he came in and he was big into, uh, a lot of eclectic type bands and things like that. CJ, the, the female vocalist, she was a good friend of mine. And I, I, I went to watch her perform like opera and things like that. So all the, incorporating her into the music that came from like completely like early Celtic frost. I, I, that's 100%. Pandemonium oh man. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like the idea of that was completely taken from. Right. Frost. Right. 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 Um, so Burnley comes in now. He's but he's not on that album, is he? Yes, he is. He is. Yes, he left uh, after "To Welcome the Fade." Why did I think I didn't realize he was on there? Okay, yeah, he is. Okay, young guy, younger than you, I assume. Uh yeah. Um, you also have Sasha Horn, which is interesting because was that was this one of his early bands? You guys. And then he came back. Yeah, he's on that album, and then he comes back, and he's on like two more with us. Yeah, yeah, because he played with Craig and uh, for about a year in the Reformed Forbidden when they did uh, Omega Wave. But he he left us the second time to move out that way and and join Forbidden. Um, but, but he's a Chicago guy though. Uh, yeah. Well, not anymore. He's he's lives no, on. Then, yes, then. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So, I mean, I had, I'm not going to lie to you, Paul. I had not revisited these albums in quite a long while. Oh, man, that's all right. And so I did. So I did. Um, and, you know, we did this pretty condensed. So I wasn't able to listen to every single album. I kind of was like, okay, I got I to gotta spot check these. And I was like, man, these are, these are much better than I remember them being. But that's what 20, 15, 20 years of time and distance does. You know how it is. You start collecting and shit masses up and you kind of forget what you even have it's yeah point. absolutely it's a disease of course i see you have those star wars well, diseases. well yeah shit i mean that's <laughs> <laughs> i see yeah, I, yeah. I know you know um, yeah my just tell your star wars room i'm in right now so but this this is the album that i start to see the more modern sound of november's doom on this is the album that i start to go okay now i recognize because remember i'm coming in the album you know after this one right coming in on this one yes and this is the album that i started to go okay that's the the key turning point in the band do you agree with that uh clearly I, not i think we had <laughs> chapters i think we had chapters in the band and and you see i i see every album as a turning point until a certain point i i see a mid was absolutely nothing like sculptured ivy and sculptured ivy was absolutely nothing like the knowing and then right. when we got to to welcome the fade it was kind of like the best elements of the first three records to create to welcome the fade and to welcome the fade for me was the so this is the one turning point in the band okay that is yeah, when, i wouldn't disagree with you either that's when i started feeling like less of a fraud was with that album the first three albums it, it, it's such bullshit it, it, it it's such uh oh god how do i explain this i did not put in the thought or the care in the lyrics i was writing what i thought people wanted to hear in that genre and it wasn't mm -hmm. until to welcome the fade that i said all right, man, I, I can't, I, I have no more bullshit to write. So I, I've got to take it to a new place. I got to take it to a personal place. And at, that just, I put my heart on my sleeve. And from that moment forward, everything is extremely personal to me in my life as far as lyrics go. So I've got a much more personal connection to the music, you know, that point on. I'm not saying that I dislike, I mean, I, I can go back and listen to those early albums too. And, and there are times where I'll go, Oh damn, that was a really good song. We should we should think about doing that one again or things like that. But uh, I don't revisit the old stuff too often. Well, so. it's as you said, they're they're kind of like Polaroids, right? I mean, yeah. albums are kind of like Polaroids of where you're at. You're a young man there. You're very young. You're in your twenties, right? 
Yeah. And the way that you think as a 20 year old changes a lot dynamically as life comes at you. And oh, absolutely. And let's be honest, man, for most of us, life is a motherfucker. A lot of the time it comes at you and it just pummels the shit out of you. And you how you respond to it is how you move forward. Right. Right. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of very, as you said, there's a lot of very personal stuff on this. Uh, Just the song titles alone. Uh, can you talk about any specific instances on here, like um, where things were just emotionally raw? And and I would imagine a lot of it actually based on. Now again, I didn't get a chance to sit down and investigate and relitigate all the lyrics, but I remember at the time, this album was a, a constant in my car for quite a while because, you know, it's early two thousands, and I'm going through a divorce around 2004 a little bit after this comes out and you know i have young children that are affected by that and you know how what a motherfucker that is right very Um, much and and what a crushing fucking intensely emotional and and physically draining thing that experience can be was was it was after this though that that what you went through that right that album i was diagnosed with my spine disease um right and that is basically the turning point for lyrics and, and where my mind was at. It was, it was a, Oh yeah, man, it was rough. That was a rough time in my life that, uh, um, swallowed by the moon was, uh, a suicide note to my infant daughter. And, uh, that's why I can't wow. do that song live. Um, that's on pale haunt, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm crossing, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's from 12th and the fade on. It's like, it started with 12th and right. the fade. And I, I, the, the version you have, there's the re-release that I like the cover on the original better. It, it, I don't, oh, I've never seen that. Is it in here? Is the artwork in there? It might be. It's just, it's the plain, it might be the back cover instead. I'm not sure. Just that? No, that's the same thing. No, that's, that's the original cover. Oh, yes. it is? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. And so what that represented is there was a point where my spine was so bad, I had to go in and have uh, a bunch of needles in my back. And uh, right. it was, yeah, it, it was just a very, very traumatic time. Really, I had a lot of emotional things going through and that just kind of like followed along. And uh, well, did you, if I recall correctly... I remember when Novella came out, which is the only one I can't find. I I can't find it. I have it, but I can't find it. Um, And I remember when that came out, you guys did a video, I think in Belgium, I believe it was, Vassalar maybe or something. Yeah. And and I remember seeing you and thinking, man, is he okay, man? Because he doesn't look well. You were very heavy at the time. Yeah. I think had a lot to do with your disease, probably, uh, being able, not able to... uh, exercise or be physically engaged in that kind of thing was there i'm going to ask a tricky question here dude okay was there were you on painkillers at this point in time i've I've been on painkillers for over 30 years every day yeah i'm still on painkillers yeah and that was that was that affecting you a lot in in terms of how your physical health was no i think i think it's affected memory more than anything um I, 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 my spine is bad. I need the painkillers, um, just to have any sort of normalcy. Um, so unfortunately it is kind of one of those things. And in this country, it's getting harder and harder to get the medicine that I actually need. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it was, it was being so heavily involved in martial arts for my whole life. And then I got a spine disease and then I got depressed cause I couldn't do the martial arts. So I was, eating Filling it with other I, stuff. I was i was just i was giving up on everything and just basically eating fast food and and just uh i let myself go to a point where i really did think i was going to die and i didn't care and i think that's right. what kind of scared me i kind of got to that point where i went all right i'm gonna i'm gonna go to sleep now in this chair because i slept in not a chair for up. years and, and i'm not gonna up. wake up right yeah. And then I thought, and then what? And then your daughter wakes up and finds you. Exactly. I, I can't, yeah. I can't do that. So I had to take control of my life at that moment. 
which meant changing a lot of things, taking what my What did daughter. you do? Yeah, what did you do? Because, man, I'll never forget seeing you in that video and thinking, damn, man, he does not look well. Like, like I was – I don't know you at that point ever, right? I don't, I've never even seen you physically. But I'm seeing this image on, on the video, and I'm like, man. I did have look- the flu. I did have the flu at that show. That no, I do no, remember. It wasn't even that, dude. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. It was that you were massively heavy at that point. Oh, I know. I was about 400 pounds at my heaviest. Exactly. What the fuck did you do? Because then suddenly, not suddenly, but within uh, probably over two year period, I see you and I'm like, wait, what is going on? I wondered, did you have gastric bypass done? I, I went, I, I went. I So, yeah, I thought that was going to be my answer. And in order to do that, they send you, you have to go through like consultation or all that kind of stuff. So I went in and I went through the consultation and they said, the only way that insurance will cover a procedure like this is you have to prove to them you're serious and you have to lose like 50 or 75 pounds, whatever it is on your own first. And I went, if I can lose 50 to 75 pounds on my own, I don't need you. Yeah. Why don't I just keep going? Right. So and I think that's kind of what they are, they want you to do. So yeah. I remember I, I left there pissed as hell and I pulled into a checkers that was like right by the hospital. And I, I'm like, give me one, everything. I was like so <laughs> mad. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, it was at that point. Like I, I got, I, that really defeated me. I was like this now, now I have no help. Now I'm just going to fucking die. And, uh, I, I, I was going through a really, uh, rough marriage at the time. Right. Um, so it got to that point where I needed to get my daughter out of that environment. I, I needed, and to do that, I had to get myself well. So I woke up, I said, I, I have to fix what I can fix in my life. I have, I can change my weight that I know I can do. I can't fix my spine disease. I could take my daughter out of this situation so it was literally like that. I hit rock bottom. I woke up and I said, that's it. I, I will never, never look back again. I have to do this for me. I have to do this for my daughter. And uh, I cut out all carbs, all sugar. Uh, I cut my calorie intake down to like a thousand a day, sometimes less. I know I know everyone's going to be like, oh, you starved yourself. I went to a heart doctor. I, I did doctors the whole time, constantly testing to make sure that that I stayed as healthy as I could the whole process and i dropped uh i went from 400 pounds down to uh, 165 pounds in just over a year dude that's fucking insane man and that i've kept it off I, i've kept almost all of it off for about uh 10 years now it, you have, it, man it's stunning I, it's stunning seeing how healthy you look at times i was like man he looks too fucking skinny now like honestly, <laughs> i thought that a couple I, times you know i'm like wow like he's I overdid it at first. 165 was like, see, but it, remember too, me getting down to 165, not, not to be like gross for everybody, but when you're such a mammal that I was, that skin doesn't really go anywhere but down. So yeah, that's another surgery or a surgery if you wanted all of that removed. And I'm right. probably carrying 15 to 20 pounds of, of, skin. of skin that's of, like- yeah. I can't afford that. So it's like, uh, you know, whatever. I'm not trying to win any beauty pageants anymore. I'm in my fifties. So fuck it. Do you do, um, uh, what kind of like exercise do you do? You ride bike or do you just walk or I, I, I walk when I can, but right. you know, my spine, just cause I lost the weight, the disease didn't go away. It made, it made things easier on me. I'm more mobile. I can get around. Uh, it's one sure. of the reasons why we will never be able to tour. Uh, I don't know who that is. I'll let that go to boys. I'm sorry. I have a sick dog. So I'm, uh, I'm waiting for a call from the vet. Okay. But I don't think that was it. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So yeah, um, it was, um, one um, of the reasons you can't tour like lengthily is because of your spine. It's a big part of it. I mean, uh, we, we're older guys. A few of sure. us have, have a lot of health issues. Some are, are quite serious. Uh, and we keep a lot of stuff private, you know, we don't, we don't sure, sure, sure. give a lot of that stuff, but yeah, there's, but there's a few of us too. Your family guys too, right? Right. So there, there's few of us that, that things are very difficult to get away for any length of time. So we're at best like a week run kind of band where we, we could not do more than that anymore, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Um, getting back to the albums real quick. 
And, and thanks for sharing all that because that's not easy stuff to talk about. But I mean, I, I'm an open book, man. I I, think, I I always said if I if I can if uh, sorry going off on another rant here. Uh, no, I, I get messages all the time from people about lyrics or a song that we had and hey it got me through like my mom had passed and it, you your music got me through the darkest time of my life and when i wanted to hurt myself i didn't because i had you and i'm like that kind of stuff to me that is the uh the greatest reward for for anything that we do so even like this even conversations like this if there's something that that i say about myself personally that someone else can go oh man i, I feel that way i i got and i i it can, it can give somebody something, even, even a little bit of hope or anything, man, I I'm that that's all it's about. That's all it's about. I just, uh, yeah, I know that very well. And in, in a different sort of zone, I mean, I was, I talked to you about the, the neurological illness that I have. That's, you know, really not it, it, the end game is not good, but, um, I was because of anxiety. I, I, I experienced right around the time I was getting married and, and my, X and I were starting to kind of, uh, oh, actually I was getting married and we, we found out we, she was pregnant with my first child. Um, I was graduating college and I was kind of a late bloomer to coming out of college. I did the two years out of high school. Then I quit for five years. Then I went back and finished. Right. Cause I really wasn't serious when I was there the first time I was partying and flunking out and going to metal shows and doing all that stuff that you know, I wasn't taking it serious. And around the time I was graduating college in 94, I started experiencing like just crippling panic attacks, crippling yeah. anxiety attacks and went to the doctor. And of course, what's the answer? Oh, here, take this, you know? And so I started taking a, a benzodiazepine, which is like a Xanax or a, a Cl I was on Clonopin and I took it for years just thinking, oh, you know, the doctor gave it to me. It's safe. You know, it's, right. it's okay. Right. Uh, Long term, I believe it's the reason that I'm damaged like this. I think it had a massive effect on my oh, man. on my health. And so I'm pretty open about speaking about it because if I can help someone else that's struggling with either withdrawal or with an issue like that or maybe not starting them, to be honest with you, which is kind of – I don't get on my soapbox and say, you should do this because it happened to me. I just am op I'm an open book to speaking about stuff like this because it's my experience. It's my strength. It's my hope. You know what I mean? How do you handle not to get all fucking trip double A on you, not to get AA on you because I'm not even an AA guy anymore. I was for a while, but I'm not anymore. But it's just what I can offer. So if someone yeah. takes some strength from I got a message not too long ago, and the guy's like, man, dude, that hit hard. I was talking to a, a different person uh about these medications and he's like dude i'm in that that fight and i said anytime you need to talk here's my private here's how to reach me privately i'll i'll help you all i can and so i appreciate you going down that road because it's not a comfortable place to be but if it's helpful to other people that's what we're here for right that's absolutely the essence of being a human being is to reach out and help someone else when they need help, I think. Makes sense to me. <laughs> so um, I want to move into this album because this is my favorite album. You've heard that a million times, I'm sure. That is um, our most popular, uh, I, I believe. It's our best-selling and our our, our, uh, our most popular record. I think, yeah, I think, and that's not to denigrate any of the following albums at all because oh, there's sure. a lot of, of great stuff. I just think some, the, the elements all came together here. There was sort of a, a perfect storm of of riffs and vocals and melodies and i mean there are just some stunning tracks on here and i did re-listen to this the whole way through because i couldn't stop i was like i gotta listen to the whole thing and you know songs like um the pale heart departure man just oh. what a fucking killer fucking track dude I, and Thank you. you know swallowed by the moon and then autumn reflection which i believe is dedicated or is about your daughter yes. talk about this album and creating it and kind of what went into making this such a, an epic fucking statement, man. We, uh, we had everything to gain and nothing to lose at that point. When we were writing, we had just brought Vito, uh, into the fold. So he was a new guitar player at the time, young, he was only 20 years old. 
Uh, we couldn't even play like over 21 show for like six months after Vito joined because he wasn't 21 yet. So uh, we got this this new fresh blood and and we our contract was up with our label. So we had free run and we did like a quick four song demo off of stuff from from that we for Pale Haunt. And uh, we were getting a lot of well, this is on the end, right? Yeah, we, we eventually signed with the end. We, we were getting a lot of traction and we got offers from, I will just say, a couple of the labels that any metal band in the world wants to be on would sign in a heartbeat. Right. I did not. I would not. Why? Uh, I, I will not mention any names whatsoever. Um, okay. two of the labels that approached us that we would have been wonderful for our careers to sign to in, in some regard, uh, wanted everything. And when wow. I tell you, when I tell you everything, they wanted a hundred percent merchandise rights. Wow. Uh, they wanted a hundred percent publishing rights. Uh, and they wanted me to hand over ownership and rights of novembersdoom.com. All of that sort of stuff. They wanted, and that, that I'm not even getting into first writer refusal clauses. I'm not getting into, they're going to pick your album cover for you. <laughs> I, I, th okay. they were, they, so were, they, wanted, they wanted full control. You don't have to say the labels. I can say them. Probably Century Media or Nuclear I'm, Blast or something. I know you're not going to say anything, but I'm I, just guessing. Yeah, just I, guessing. I just, uh, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, yeah. So in other words, it was, hey, Paul, guys, bend over. We're going to fuck you really hard, but we're going to make sure your album's out there that everybody can see it, but you won't really see any money from it, essentially. And then it was like, well, uh, you guys are going to have to tour like six months out of the year. And I'm like, you want us to tour for six months? You're not going to really give tour support. Yeah, where are we? When and, are we going? And you're going to take a hundred percent of the merchandise rights? Oh, dude! <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Man. Okay. Yeah. No. No. I, I'd rather. And and so we have always signed because you know what? Again, to be fair, if we were that kind of band that said. We want to do this as a living. This is going to be our career. Then maybe that would have been the right choice to make because right. then they they put. But we we're more artists. We we don't right. want to compromise. To me, I've always said that album, from beginning to end, this every page, child. every every piece of artwork, the the cover, the music, the lyrics, it all paints one big picture. And if some outside source comes in and changes something of our vision. I, I mean, look at, look at like I, at that band Evanescence. I, I know crazy off the wall, but they've, they forced her to put that rap section in that song. Cause that's what was big at the time. I don't know if you just saw it. They, she, they just released that song, a demo version of it I without did, no. that. And it, it the song Changes. is just as good. Okay, <laughs> it, It's like, okay. So, I, I mean, some of the decisions that are made on that end, and I know plenty of bands that did sign to bigger labels and they turned their album in and then the studio came back and went, well, we're going to have you go back in the studio and you're going to record these four songs that we right. have written for you. Yeah. And then they go in and do that. And then lo and behold, those are the songs that are now the singles, which they didn't write. They didn't want right. any part of it. And right. You know, and I, I so, know bands like this, so it's yeah. I mean, so like you said, these these albums, these songs, they're your children, man. They are they are a part of you physically, emotionally, for better or for worse. You know, for better or worse, right? And 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 like you said, man, you've got an album. You've got a you sign. You get this big advance, which you have to pay back anyways, right? right. And and then you're saying like you're not getting tour support. Yeah, those are those are fucking raw deals. Why would anyone why would anyone want to do it? And I can answer that question. Because if you're a young kid in particular and you see that allure of going out and touring the world, seeing the world and you're going to play in front of people 
and you're gonna you know sell all these albums and this is back in the day when albums sold which they don't anymore of course um you're gonna be rock stars man you're gonna be rock stars and that's really not the way that it turns out for oh, most no. bands sadly right and then you not don't own and then you don't own anything that were the fruits of your hard labor right so and I mean, people like might say, "Well, it's not hard to sit down and write a song and be a musician." That's that's not true at all. I mean, it's. Sorry. I, I know a lot of musicians, and it's a hard life, right? Holy fuck! Hold on, sorry, dude. I, I'm getting this emergency, uh, and it's I am too. What the hell? I don't know if you can hear me or not. Are we back? Yeah, mine is too. What the hell is? Like, what the fuck is that? I've never, seen, I've never had Damn one it. of those before. <laughs> That was bizarre. Right in the middle of our interview, right when things were getting juicy. I can't and hear you. Give me one second. I got to reset my audio. I don't know what this just did to me. I can hear Found. you. How about that? I can hear you. you got me yet? I no. can hear you. I, unbelievable. Can you hear me? Paul, can you not hear me? Oh, that shit. That would be my input. Output. All right, how's that? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay, hey. Got me. Okay, cool, cool. Jesus. You all right? Yeah, did you get that minute, same I thing? Think, I don't think you could hear me there for a minute. No, I got uh, – all of a sudden there was this uh, national yeah. test pop. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. it. It it killed the audio. And it, <laughs> Oh, no shit. Okay. Yeah. How are we doing on time? We're about an hour and 20. You got an hour left in you? No? Yeah, I got it, man. I'm good. I'm good. I, I don't want to keep you if you got something you got to do. So no, the only thing I got to just keep. Well, I'm watching for. Uh, I got to pay for a bill. Call. Right, right. Which is fine. That, you take that. That's fine. No, um, I'm, I'm good at the moment, man. So, so this album, we'll go back to this in the end and everything like that. So you go with the end, and the end at that point in time is kind of a a a, a really well. And that, what's his name? Andreas, right? Was that his name? Andreas. Okay, I, so, I tell you, yeah. Go ahead. We uh, we we. So as we were still shopping, Pale Haunt, um, we got an opportunity to uh, open for the gathering uh, here in the states on tour, and the gathering was on the end records at the time, and Agaloc was the middle band of that opening for them. So we got brought on. I remember that tour. Yeah, us Agaloc and the gathering. Mm -hmm. And that is Andreas was the tour manager on that. So as we did that tour, we were the opening band. We supplied backline and he just, um, he really liked our professionalism and the way we handled everything and stuff like that. So as we were going, we were discussing the possibilities of working together and then it just, it worked out. Well, um, and I remember that tour because you played, in Washington D.C., that was the one that I almost made it down to. But the nine thirty club with, with one of my which was which was it the nine thirty club I believe nine thirty yeah yeah which by the way doesn't do metal shows anymore at all they just do house and club stuff I love nine thirty that was a great venue man here's what bands remember the nine thirty club had one of the greatest showers I've ever had in my life <laughs> <laughs> nice I tell like, you yes. Yeah, oh, like man. You actually washed the stink off, right? The water pressure could take skin off your body. It was nice. it was incredible. And, and nice. it, it, it's so stupid, but when you're on the road and you get a and you get like a comfort like that, you're like, little oh thing. my god, this is the greatest thing ever. It's nine thirty club like that, right? Greatest yep. shower on the road. <laughs> nice, nice. And I'll tell you, if you I don't know when's the last time you were there. Do you remember? Has it been many, many oh, years? I was there the one time we that played, so it was a long time ago. Well, yeah, that was Rob, what year was that? That was that was for uh, I five, six. It might have been. It was for Pale Hunt, two thousand and six. Six. Um, that area down there was a pretty bad area, pretty rough area. You were like literally right off M U Street, where all the like you know college bars and shit were. But behind you was a pretty tough area of DC. That area now, Paul, you wouldn't you wouldn't even know it if you drove in there. It's so wow gentrified there's million dollar million dollar half million dollar condos right all around the 930 club it's bizarre wow wow I went down there to see gary newman back in i think 29 2018 or 19 i forget 2018 
I, I didn't even like driving in. I'm like, what the fuck, man? Like this doesn't even look remote. It's another world. So, you know, that wow. Wow. And a lot of these clubs, like, did you ever play Philly? Did you ever play uh, Trocadero? No, no, I don't. I don't think we've ever played Philly. Like, like whenever we go out that way, it's always been Baltimore or Boston or you know, New York. I've never actually played in Philly. Okay. So Philly had, you know, had a lot of really cool venues that now either they don't do metal, they only do rock shows, or they don't do shows at all. They've closed down like the truck. Now, so, some development group bought that and they're going to renovate it. It's an old theater. It's a beautiful old theater. But, I mean, it was falling into disrepair. But, I mean, I've seen, like, you know, fucking Morbid Angel and Frontline and every band you can think of I've probably seen there, Porcupine Tree. And it was like, oh, man, like, that's a bummer. And it was pretty much COVID that shut it down. So, um, but yeah, I do remember that tour and I really wanted to get down and see it because you and Agalock together was like, oh man, this has got to be killer. And it was, you know, like you said, it was in this, right in this era for this, for this album. Um, so we moved from this album right here, um, to, I think it's the one I don't have, which is uh, novella, right? Yes. And, uh, or was it a photic? I'd have to look it up. Somebody um, in the and chat no, okay, I think know. novella novella was next. Yes, it, I think it was novella, novella. and novella and still- <laughs> kind of a kind of a concept album, sort of kind of novella. Um, yeah, ev- everything everything from to welcome the fade on is themed. They're not the only concept album I ever did was the knowing. Everything okay. after that are themes. So yeah, the okay. theme of novella is is water. So water. everything kind of right. like revolves around water. Yeah, yeah. And that is my only November's Doom shirt that I own is Novella, which I love it. But <laughs> but I've gotten fat over the years. <laughs> and so my medium, it doesn't it fits, but it barely fits. Let's just put it that way. It's more like a belly, it's more like a belly shirt. Not that anybody needs to know that. So um, <laughs> but yeah, so that album, man, kicks off with a song I've heard you talk about in in some of the interviews you've done, and you're like, man. We got to do rain, but I'm kind of tired of doing rain because we got to do it. But, but I mean, you know, it's just such a fucking slamming track, man. It just, it's. Just I love the song. It's it's fun to play live. It goes by quick for me. It's just it's kind of like you know how it is though, man. You 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 get these certain songs like, and if you if you play all the songs that that everyone expects, it leaves you with such little room to play anything else especially right. when you're only getting like 45 minutes or an hour or something like we have 11 albums to try to pick songs. Right. From. That's hard for you guys. Cause you're never getting like a two hour set. Yeah, I don't think we'd be able to pull off two hours. I, I just just physically. Ask, could, you that, <laughs> could you do that physically? Like, could your voice take that for two hours? I uh, know. No, I, I would have to do a lot of the, the mellow clean singing. I could not growl for two hours. There's no way. Not, not at my age, not anymore. It, it takes my body so much longer to heal than it used to. Like, well, yeah, even shows two days in a row are difficult on my voice now. I was just going to say, speaking about that, like, you know, I've, I've tried to do a death growl, man. And dude, I, I cannot do it because it literally roaches my throat. And I've heard people say, well, you're not doing it right. You got to do it from your, your abdomen, from your diaphragm. I'm like, bro, I've tried that. It fucking shreds. Yeah. I, I mean, and people say that shit and, and it's like, okay, guess what? Guess what? The sound is made by vocal cords. Exactly. This is not making the sound. Exactly. This is, this is controlling it. breath. Yeah. But th- this makes the noise. That's the noise. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you do an album, I would imagine you you have to space some things out a little bit just to get the full effect often. Am I right? Or are you kind of, when you're tracking vocals, is it a boom, boom, boom process? Or you do, do you space it out? Um. So this this is going to probably... Pull the curtain back. It's going to anger, anger, anger some people. Uh there are albums, probably most uh, of them, except for maybe a couple of songs I wasn't as comfortable with here or there. I think like Pale Haunt, The Growls, I think that's all one take. Wow. Um, there's a lot of albums that is one take. I, I'll just go in, I'll do the whole song. Okay, move on to the next one. And I just, and I, I just roll. And mm-hmm. uh, if I get in that groove and I can go, the less I have to, 
if if I'm if I'm growling, 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 and I have to stop and wait, and they got to rewind, and I got to listen, and then I, I try to get the the more downtime I have, the faster right. I'm going to lose my throat. So if I can just go in and blast through and and get, and then I can go back and and fix whatever like I, I wanted to. You punch like in that, and just punch in, or or now. You're just doing it Pro Tools, I would assume, right? Or if I just redo it right away, yeah, I oh, just okay. jump in. But for the most part, like I can knock through a lot of that stuff. Like, in, in do you have any shot. prep that you do to get in that zone as far as <laughs> no. getting the throat ready? Now you're just going <laughs> cold. Yeah, and that's I know that's bad. I said I, I this is why I've I've said, man, I I've done everything wrong my entire career. <laughs> like I don't <laughs> warm up. I don't I don't. Uh, yeah, it's really dumb. And I know it's probably why I struggle and why I've never been able to maintain like time because I, I don't do it the right way. But uh, I can just imagine the comments section of this now. All the November doomsters going, Paul's a fraud. He said he's a fraud. He's right. <laughs> hey, I, I have duped you all. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. But I, I, I see where you're coming from, though. I mean, that's it's not. And, 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 and we, go ahead. I, it's like, yeah, I just I, I never did any of it like 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 uh, and I, I say fraud and I, I mean it in that way like guys like Larry and Vito and Gary and Mike they have spent hours and hours and hours perfecting the craft perfecting their craft I didn't do that I but you I, know what, and, man? And, and 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 if I did I could have been so much better but I but, I didn't I I Paul, seriously man like <laughs> I know I know Mike too I used to see him at every tour i'd go backstage because i i knew stephen wilson and i'd get free passes and whatnot and i guarantee you one thing mike never mike never prepared either you know his preparation was you know cigarettes and maybe a bottle of whatever he's drinking at the point in time and that was just because he had it right then and there he had it and that was it it's not like andre bocelli or fucking Pavarotti or you know that let's be honest here it's a specialized niche of vocal technique. But in essence, what you're telling me is you didn't really have any technique. You just had what it was and you did what you did. I made it up as I went along and it worked for me. And I I, I don't know any other way to like I, I've tried. I did teach my daughter how to growl on FaceTime. She was in the studio. Really? She FaceTimed me. She's like, Dad, I, they want me to do this. What? Wait, how do I do this? And I go, OK. Start and I, I, I kind of walked her through it and built her up, built her up, and she let out this like gut curdling. It was it was amazing. I was very proud gonna, of Dad at the moment. She gonna sing with the band, or is she singing with the band or something? I'm not gonna say too much about what she's got going on, okay. but I will say that yeah, she's uh, she's she's gonna follow in Dad's footsteps. I think. Nice, that's pretty cool. That's she's a lot more cool. talented than I am. She's amazing. Does she live with you still or no? Yeah, yeah, she does. Okay, cool, cool. Um. She sounds a lot like uh, uh, Billie Eilish when she sings. Actually, she's she's got a phenomenal voice, a singing voice as opposed to a growl, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Well, I I'm going to send you something when we're done. I, I want you to hear some of my daughter's stuff. Just just yeah, for yeah. and giggles because awesome. most people that hear are like, dude, she's like, I don't. Do you know who Marissa Nadler is? Marissa Nadler, kind no, of a I'm doom not... folk, doom folk. I am not sure. It's okay, I'm going to send you some stuff for her, too. I'll send okay. you a link to check out because I, I think you'll dig it. But she's been compared to her a little bit, and she's writing. And she took up the guitar and just occasionally would call me and be like, Dad, well, I'm trying to I'm trying to do this. And I'd be like, well, all right, well, let me show you how to do the finger-picking thing and exercise to, to get better at it, the Travis-picking thing or whatever. And now, man, I'm like, she's writing these songs, and she's a keyboard player, too. And I'm like, where in the, where in the fuck is this coming from? Like, this is insane. Like I'll send you some stuff and see what yeah, you think. So yeah, definitely. Curious. And isn't that the coolest fucking rush in the world? Oh yeah. She's, it's, she's, she's, she's sang on a few albums with me of ours and right, she's right, joined the later on stage right. a couple times. And yeah, she's, she's actually on one of the earlier, there's one you hear a, a baby giggling. I had her in the, the vocal booth when she was a toddler. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's been around it her whole life. That's <laughs> awesome, man. That is so cool. Um, so we get to, we go through novella and that's, you know, again, so many good tracks. I don't have that one. So unfortunately I can't, I can't show up, but, and then these two kind of come out in fairly quick succession. Okay. We've yeah. got, we've got a and we've got, um, uh, 
Sorry. Not, uh, Into Nights and Requiem Inferno. We Inferno, just call it. I always get yeah. it backwards. I say Infernal Requiem. Um, and what I sense in these two albums, and I could be wrong, but I think I'm, I don't think I am. I think you guys tune even lower on the on aphotic. I think you go into C tuning, I believe, because were you in D before that, or were you in C, or is it B? C to B. I'd have to ask Larry, right? Yeah, you know, I I know <laughs> there was a time where we tuned down to A. Oh um, shit, really? Earlier A, and then I think they drop tune to B. I think this one's drop B. I, I think a I think it's yeah, drop B. I think that's what it is. And, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, we didn't really talk about the, the, the member changes much. We've referenced them quick. But Larry comes in on uh, The Knowing, I believe, right? Yes. And and then Eric leaves. Was there, was there, was, was it a, a creative difference thing with Eric? Or what, what was going on that, that he kind of exited after three albums? Eric uh, found his future wife in another state. Uh, he moved with her to start his life with her. And then he found, uh, he found uh, a new life in religion and he started going on missionaries and helping in other countries and things like cool. that. So he, he turned his life into uh, uh hang on one second. I'm sorry. I'm yep. so sorry. Take it. Hello. I'm, so, I'm sorry. You, Mo was, just, Mo was just fired in front of my face and now I'm completely alone. Oh God. Uh, I Sorry. No, that's cool. Are you good? That daughter in a panic. Oh, okay. I muted you there for a sec. Just so no, no, started. she's good. Yeah. She's good. Okay. Uh, speak. She must have her ear, ears must have been ringing. We were talking about her. Um, yeah. So, so he left to get into the, you know, whatever yes. it was. Just life change, li lifestyle change. Yeah. Which is cool, man. I mean, there's no, uh, no drama there. I'm sure that was a pretty oh, man, we we wished thing. him luck. He he remained a, a friend. Yeah, it was it was all good. It was all good. You bring um, you bring in Vito, for yes. um, after Welcome to the Fade, you bring him in for for Pale Haunt, right? And I, I personally, I notice kind of a a change in the way the riffs are and the way the melodic structures of the band are. Do you agree with that a little bit, or do you agree that he really brought something sort we, of special to the mix? Oh, absolutely. And we we kind of let him run with it. Like Vito came in and he had these ideas, and he had like he was really like Vito is really big in uh, like Nevermore and and bands like that, and with a little oh. bit more of a, a, a an uppy. So that is about the time where we started saying, yeah, you know what? Let's let's pick up some energy a little bit. Let let's like we don't need to be you know the slow turtle all the time Let, let's right. so it, it we just kind of around pale haunt forward is when i do believe that's the true birth of the band pale haunt okay. was the start of november's doom i think we were really trying to find ourselves because even when you go back to like a photic and and inry in tonight's requiem inferno um and i said this in the beginning of the interview inry for me was that one album that we did not try to push ourselves forward with. We got to writing that record and we went, okay, let's take the best stuff from Pale Haunt, Novella, and Aphotic, or, 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 or Novella and, and uh, uh, Inferno. Yeah, Aphotic, and, and, and let's, let's write the next album of the best stuff of that. So we tried to create better versions of what we already did with the album of Inri. I like that album. I like it a lot. I think the songs are incredibly solid when it came out. It's more received better now than it was when it first came out. And I don't know why that is. I think it was, it was, it was darker. Inri was a lot heavier. We tried to keep that more heavy feeling from pale haunt and novella and get even heavier with it. And, uh, I like I like the album a lot. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we put it out. It was probably the only one in in our entire catalog where we made a conscious effort to do something or try to do something that we already did better. And I don't think any of us felt that 
I think we we made comparable, but I don't think we made better. And I think that's when we kind of decided, yeah, you know what, we got to keep challenging ourselves. We got to keep pushing, you know, forward to do new things. And that's Larry's influence comes in a lot of that. He's he's got a lot of really uh uh seventies progressive. Just so I'm not confused. You keep saying Inri. Are you talking about Requiem Infernal? That yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. I was like, what am I missing an album? No, I, no, that's yeah. In tonight's recommend for it's 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 it, okay. it spells I out. Gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. And I kind of screwed up. I had it is Henry and then it's a Fodic is, is the one after it. So um the I, I forgot to ask you about two things though. Um one, the, the killer artwork that, that you guys have had, and that's been sort of a key throughout your your career, especially I mean, the early albums, I think you did a lot of the work on, right? Yeah. And and these right here, right? But I, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I stopped doing that because I can never enjoy my own artwork. I, I look at it and go, oh, man, I should have did this. I should have did that. I should have changed this. Why didn't I do this? So I, I didn't. I wanted to enjoy my own album's artwork. So I'm like, I'm going to start hiring people to do it. Well, so I'm criticize so myself. So speaking of that, and I, I don't think you need to be uh, denigrating on, on those early artworks. They're good. Um, but you, you bring in, you start a relationship with Travis Smith and scene pieces. Mm -hmm. And how did that, did you reach out to him or, or how did that work out that you got, got him on board for some of yeah. these albums later? I reached out to him earlier on and uh, yeah, I was, I was, I used them for a few in a row. And then I got to that point where I, I think Travis was being so utilized by a lot of the bands yeah. in the same genre that I started using him for like every other album right. to try to get like slightly different feeling pieces. And I found like a lot of really great artists out there and, and they captured like really close to what my vision was. But uh, yeah, I mean, here's, I think this is his first one for you, right? Yeah, that's yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I got the slipcase version from dark symphonies and yeah. Um, cool. Again, I'm an old, I'm old school brother. <laughs> um, yes. Beautiful, beautiful artwork on this man. It's so cool looking, so dreamy and evocative, but yet at the same point in time, kind of, you know, it, it's early Photoshop. I assume, I, I guess. I don't. I'm not really an artist, so I wouldn't know. But it's yeah. graphic art as opposed to a painting. Um, yes, it is so, so evocative. And then we move into. This album, which I didn't actually bring up one other point about this album that maybe people may or may not know. You you mentioned Vito being a, a fan of Nevermore. This album was produced by Neil Kernan, yeah. who did uh, Dreaming Neon Black, which was one of my fucking absolute banger favorites of all times because Warhol's my dude, man. That guy was just such a fucking oh, yeah. oh, godlike shit. Um, what was it like working with like a big name producer? I mean, I don't know that he was as big then, but he he was pretty big. I mean, he he already had his Grammys and stuff like that when we worked with him. He was right. already huge. Yeah. Well, How did that come about? Like, can you speak to that a little bit? He walked in my house one day. <laughs> what? He was friends with, um, so he was recording Macabre yeah. at the time. And Mary, our bass player at the time, was dating the bass player of Macabre. Okay. So they were in the area. We were having a, a get together with some uh, with some band guys, and Mary came by. And she brought her boyfriend in Macabre, and she brought Neil, and they walked in my house one day, and we started talking. And did you know it was him, or did she introduce him? And then no, I had no idea who he was. Oh, I, right, I right, had right. no. Yeah, no, I is just some little some English dude. dude. I had no idea who he some was. Dude, right, we right. started talking, and it was like, "Oh, holy shit!" Yeah, he's he he does the whistle at the end of Benny and the Jet, that famous uh, whistling oh, at right. the end of the live version. That's Neil. Yeah. He does. Yeah. yeah. So he's done docking. He's done. Yeah, so much stuff. So what yeah, was yeah. it like? What was it like working with someone like Neil Kernan? I think you will get a different answer from every individual of this band if you ask that question too. Sure. Um, some really enjoyed the experience and really got a lot out of the experience. Other people hated every minute of it and did not enjoy the experience at all. Um, okay. When you bring in someone of that caliber, I think you need to be prepared that you are, you are bringing in a, a proven professional and there is a certain amount of uh, control you need to give that person. Right. for them to do their job correctly. And I think 
we were not all in that headspace okay. at that time to truly right. like em embrace the experience. I think we were still new, wet behind the ears. Um, You're how old at this point for into uh, to welcome the fade? That's two thousand and you're in your thirties, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mid thirties. Yeah, yeah just, just range. yeah, right in there. Right. So right. I, I mean, we're just, we're just. Uh, do you want to say where you fell on that spectrum, or do you want to not say? I uh, Neil pushed me in in good ways. I did not agree with every decision made, mm -hmm. but I I kind of like threw myself into the experience and went, okay, go with it. Do do yeah. what he tells you to do. He knows what he's talking about. You know what you've done in the last few albums. So listen right. to the man and just just do what he tells you to do. But even some of the things he was having me do, some of the other guys didn't agree with, and it, it turned okay. into like, yeah, the, the, it it was it was a. I'm glad we did it. I'm definitely glad we had that experience, and I got to work with uh, a man of that caliber. And he he was. Uh, I have not talked to him in a lot of years. I've tried to reach out. I guess he's moved uh, out of the country. I'm not sure exactly. I thought he was in Japan, but maybe I'm, I'm not positive. Yeah, I, that, I but... would have no idea. I just know, you know, he did like Under Lock and Key, did yeah. Lynch Mob, um, first Lynch Mob album. Uh, what's it called? Fuck. Wicked Sensation. He did um, Deicide. I forget which album he did with Deicide. But, I mean, and again, ministry. we talked about. A lot of ministry. A lot of ministry. ministry yeah. Oh, I wow. love Neil. I, I Neil's a great guy. Neil's a very talented guy. I think, uh, yeah, he's he's done a lot for a lot of bands. I think I think if we were to ever do something like that again, I think the band would collectively have to have a completely different mindset, right? And uh, than we did at the time. We were just kind of naive. And well, I mean, I think you spoke to it basically when you're young cats like that, and you're kind of more or less self-producing or you got a buddy that's kind of helping you an engineer that's sort of help helping you. Like, I forget who, who, who did, uh, who did the knowing? Was that a friend of yours? That was uh Chris, Chris, the uh, who we still use to this day. I mean, from right. pale Hawn on every album has been done the same way. Uh, we record with Chris and Dan Swano mixes. Okay. So, but okay. When you say record, Chris is essentially your engineer then. Yes. Okay. He, he owns the recording studio. We go in by him. We mic up everything. We record right. there. So, but he may not, I think a lot of people don't understand that a producer actually becomes sort of a member of the band and starts to create the dynamic, yes. shape the songs in a lot of ways. Right. And shapes, they may, they may be like, yeah, that, that chord just doesn't work there. And that, and that That's was the, the first problem. time we had a producer and, and everyone was like, what the fuck is this? What, what? you know, it was, yeah, it was, dude? Who's yeah, so dude, it, you know? it was, it was, uh, it, and but the thing is, is we don't necessarily feel that all of the opinions were beneficial for the music or the band, right? And at the end of the day, we have to be happy with that finished product, not the producer. He right. doesn't have to, he can move on to the next project and never sure. think about it again. We have to live with that forever. And I think some of the decisions that were made went against what some of the creatives felt were better for the song. Gotcha. And yeah. when, when you start messing, that's like walking into an artist who just made this painting and being like, oh no, this needs more yeah, red over here. There, it's like, yeah, no. Exactly. That ain't going to fly very well. So yeah, you can get how, when you get that kind of creatives together, if you're not willing to, to, to be that kind and be open to it. And uh, I, I think it was a little hesitation. And then there was kind of some ruffling of the feathers some because, because the ideas weren't, yeah. weren't aligning, but overall I'm happy with, I'm happy with the music. I'm happy with the record. Um, not as happy with the overall production as, as if you go back and listen to it compared to some of our other, even newer, uh, even pale haunt after that. It's like, I did, I did. And here's my opinion. It sounds a little thinner yes. than later productions. It's not that it's, it sounds great. I like the way it sounds, but it sounds a little, it's just, it doesn't have the fatness that some of the later productions have particularly pale haunt onward right i, I would um, love to be able to remix and remaster that album but uh we don't have the the masters anymore so that's that'll that could never happen unless we just re-recorded the whole thing who has the masters dark symphonies 
No, they're gone. They're absolutely oh, gone. Uh, so they've been recorded over or something or I, I had, I had, Oh God. <laughs> I, so I had a Drobo, a rate array drive system. And I had everything on this raid system. Okay. And it was every album artwork layout, uh, masters, individual tracks. I had everything and I had a colossal meltdown and lost oh, no. all oh. of it. Oh, fuck. So Trust we don't, I have, I have some older stuff on, but I, I'm missing, like, that's why we don't have box sets of CDs and vinyl and all of our, our label is, is like, Paul, we will put it all out. I, we need it. And I'm like, uh, I have no artwork. <laughs> well, interesting you should bring that up because um, I missed some comments, guys. I'm sorry. I'll try to go back shortly here. I just, I'm, I'm trying to move as quick as I can for Paul's sake. But I told you it might be a long one. I said I'm pretty great. Ah, man, I, I told you I left the afternoon open. I'm good. Um, but uh, where was it? Devin, you asked me a good question about. Oh, shit. Where is it? Devin. Ask me your question about the reissues because I can't fucking find it here, dude. I don't know where it's at. Uh, oh, wait. There oh, there's the chat. There I didn't is. even see it. Yeah. Speaking of buying stuff, any plans to repress November's Doom album? So there you go. Yes, that yes. Speak to it right there? What, dude, we, we, yes, the whole catalog. We're, we, we've got plans. We've got ideas. The whole thing I need to sit down and, and see. And this is the problem being a designer and the guy who lost everything it falls on me to do, I, I gotta, I gotta redo layouts and artwork for oh. every album and oh. then every vinyl. It's oh like, I don't have that kind of time. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, that would take me weeks of nonstop work. Probably months, like, maybe even months of just being 40 hours a, a week. Right. Right. That's the holdup. Yeah. That's literally the holdup. If, if I can, if I had a way even even if I can, I'll, I'll never get the booklets like they were in the CDs. Sure. So I'm looking at front cover, back cover, lyrics. I'm easy, easy. Just get it out. Um, yeah, I, I need help. There you go. There <laughs> I you need go. help, and and then and then all that can come out. So well, let I me mean, ask if anyone you this. Does, yeah, yeah. Do you have the masters in order to, or would you just be like repressing from CD copies, or or how would that work? No, we have we have digital masters. We oh, I still have okay. I, we have digital masters like finished, mixed, mastered digitals. We have all of that. How so about it's, it's uh, how about demo tracks and rarity type things? Is there much of that out there? Or is it pretty much everything you've done is out? We have or another. We have a few things for the Pale Haunt uh, re-release that we can add. We have a couple demo tracks, and we have a version of Autumn Reflection that no one's ever heard. Um, yeah, so there there are definitely uh, some things that we have that we can add to this stuff and make like we have complete live acoustic performances that we had pro recorded that we never released. Oh, wow. We got all kinds of stuff we can put out. Well, that would be killer, man. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to this real quick and then we'll move forward and get you out of here in thirty minutes or so. Um, this, damn it, where the hell is it? Okay, Attila Kiss. I'm gonna uh, blow my blow, blow myself up here. Um, this album cover is fucking iconic to me, dude. And I I don't care if it was you or somebody else that whose name was on it. In other words, November's Doom, not you personally. But this album is just so fucking evocative, dude. It is. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful artwork. I gotta think when you get this thing, you're like, holy shit, right? Um. It's just mine. There's a bunch of ugly dudes right there. Just I know, I know, I know. Um, but man, just I, talk about this artwork because it is fucking epic, dude. Epic. I, I, God, I, I don't remember how I found Attila. I found him on on the internet somewhere, and he had done very, very little up to that point. He did like a book cover for somebody, and I was like, oh my god. So he he took on the job. And if you, if you look inside the cover, the original cover for Pale Haunt was 
the scarecrow what you see the kind of the, the light behind it okay that was the original cover should be in the beginning it might be for the song pale haunt departure actually Hold on, let, me, page. let me pull it up is it this one yeah no 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 um Hold on. So this the, the this is the first one. It's like the that, angel. That was the cover. Oh, really? Okay. That was the original cover. And that it, picture that's on the cover was for the inside. It was the song. And I saw it and went, oh no, that's the no, cover. No, that's the cover. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. band fought me on that. They they didn't agree. Some oh, really? Yeah, they they and I'm like, you guys gotta trust me on this. You have you have to trust me on this. This is the cover. I'm telling yeah. you, this is the cover. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in here. But nothing like this one here is fucking killer. Oh yeah, I mean um, the, the art he did, and but and the, nothing, nothing, nothing touches this. This is that's Alpha Omega shit right there. It's just so the color, the coloring is so. Like I said, it's I don't know about you, but I'm a I'm a fall guy. I'm a full on pumpkin spice lover. Fuck <laughs> anybody that doesn't like pumpkin spice. I don't give a shit. <laughs> that's what I, I don't just give drink. a shit. <laughs> You can you can bite me. I love pumpkin spice, but and I love fall and I love Halloween and I love you know we're doing I do a a, a Halloween not a Halloween it's called the Catacombs of D Depravity. My friend and I we do a a horror sort of themed thing about once every couple of months, once every nice. three months or something like that. You're welcome to join us if you like, but it's at the end of the month. But we we show horror movies, we talk horror and just you know all that stuff. But man, this. This puts me so in the mood for, <laughs> you know, the fall and the autumn and the, and the yeah, kind of yeah. that crisp, sunny days. And then you get into the nights where it's cool and, and dark and kind of ominous. And it just speaks to every track that's on this album. This artwork just pulls me in every time. I, I hate to be so locked in on this one, Paul, but it just is the, the album that does it for me, right? Um, talk about... So what have you ever used him since or uh, no? the, the, he did one other thing for me. He did the cover of the DVD, the novella Vassilar. So he okay. did uh, that's that's his artwork as well. I have that somewhere. I don't have it out, but I and have. I it sadly that is some of the artwork I no longer have. Okay. Uh, and that kills me. And I, I have, I have managed to reach out to a few of the other artists and I got back original pieces or, or, or some of the art that I need for a few of them. But I eventually, it took me, God, almost a year to track him down, but I finally did find Attila and he told me, he retired from designing. He's no longer in it. He got rid of his hard drives oh. and he no longer had any oh. of the original digital files. Oh, shit. Ah, the thing that kills me is Pale Haunt was pressed by like three or four other record companies in Korea, in Japan. Uh, Candlelight put it out in Europe. I have right. contacted all of these companies and asked them if they have it in their archives. I can't get anyone to even respond to me, let alone try to help me find this stuff yeah that's but, in talking to a lot of different artists i hear that all the time you know craig yeah. from forbidden's trying to get right. masters and rights back from fucking massacre and some of these smaller european labels i forget off the top of my head who they are and he's like dude i've been trying for five fucking years i, I every month i try to contact yeah. somebody and i get bounced from here to here to here and it's like you know it's it just I, as a fan, it angers me. I can only imagine as an artist, you know, how that is for you. A good example of it's Forbidden's third album, Distortion. Killer album, man. He can't reissue it. He can't do anything. He can't. I don't know whether it's Pavement or Massacre. I can't remember who the label is, but he's like, I can't get the rights to it. So I can't have it reissued. And, you know, so I'm stuck. It's a great album that is way long out of press. And then for us as collectors, we go to try to find an original. It's like fucking, you know, like $150 for a CD. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan, but I'm not, I'm not that kind of fan. You know what I mean? Um, so it kind of, I, 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 I feel your pain, man. That's, that sucks. Um, what uh, I, I did want to ask about sort of the, and I think you've kind of answered it. So if we're hitting the same ground, I apologize, but 
throughout this process of the knowing uh, to welcome the fade through Pale Haunt, you know, novella, Requiem, your your profile is building and building and building, particularly around Pale Haunt and, and post that, right? Mm-hmm. Did you say you were offered a lot of opportunities to go tour? Oh yeah, and- Pale Haunt. Pale Haunt opened up huge doors for us, and and uh, Novella did as well, especially in Europe. It was at that point there was a uh, what really did it for us. There was a chain of metal stores in Europe called the Metal Zone, okay. and uh, one guy owned like fourteen of them, and uh, his name is Carl. Great, great human being, and uh, Carl had contacted us and said, Hey, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but, um, I own this chain of metal stores and the novella reservoir was, uh, the top selling record in all my stores for the year. It did better than any other metal band. And I was like, what? That's, that's ridiculous. And he's like, and I would like to bring you to Europe to do a headlining tour. I'll, I'll manage it. We'll, we'll, I'll take care of all the details. And we're like, Let, let's talk about this and give it a shot. So at that point it was like, okay, who do you want to tour with? And we're like, let, let's bring uh, uh, Agalock with us. So we did uh, hear my dog going nuts. I'm sorry. I got to look for this. Right. So yeah, we brought Agalock with, and then we, we had Saturnus join us from Denmark. Right. And, yeah. uh, and uh, yep, this is what I needed. I need, I'm so sorry. I need to walk away from you for 30 seconds. I yeah, yeah, right no, back. no, d- take your time. I'll, I'll mute you. Okay. All right, man. Sorry guys. I'll be right back. I promise. All right, guys. So we're, we're working on this. If anybody of the 12 people that are still watching, um, if anybody has any definitive questions, please get them in because I'm going to try and get him out of here in the next, I don't know, 15 to 30 minutes. You know how it goes with me. I just, we, we ramble and, and Paul's, uh, I want to talk to him about his Star Wars room a little bit too. So um, if anybody's got any questions, get them in now so that I can kind of start to weed through. I apologize if I missed some stuff earlier. I think I got most of it though. Um, but yeah, get questions in for Paul now. Appreciate everybody that's being here. That's actually more people attending this than I would have assumed would have done. So very cool. Very, very cool. And Paul's a a very uh, – willing victim today appreciate that from him and um unfortunately i do not have the last three albums so i can't really speak a lot to that but we're going to get to where real quickly here we're going to get to what's going on with the band because i'm aware that they are recording a new album and we'll talk about plans for you know 2024 and i know they've got a show coming up i believe in chicago i'm not sure where it's at i'm gonna have to ask him but there is a small festival appearance coming up here maybe maybe it's atlanta or something like that but that's happening here in november i think as a real quick aside um lots of stuff planned for the channel but my health is really taking a bad turn i'm probably going to be heading into the hospital this afternoon uh to get some things looked at and if that means i'm hospitalized that could change the uh schedule but if I'm not, um, I've got tomorrow night with Chuck. We're doing dad episode number nine. We're going to do the Beatles. And I know everybody's like, oh, the fucking Beatles, man. That ain't metal, dude. Yeah, it's not metal. I, I don't give a fuck. Um, we're, I'm going to pick Abbey Road. He's picked Magical Mystery Tour as definitive albums, uh, we're, which I know everybody's like, you know, what about Sergeant Pepper, man? Um, hang on one sec, Paul. Just wrapping up the thoughts. Um, so I'll let you know at the end of this, what the schedule is going forward, guys. So, um, Hey, yeah, I'll be right okay. um, so basically, uh, then on Sunday, I've got Matt from the accusation coming in. We're going to talk Van Halen. He's picked fair warning. I picked Van Halen too. And then Sunday evening, I've got, um, uh, Chewy, Dan Mongrain from, uh, uh, Voivod coming, but we're not really talking that much about Boy- Voivod. We'll touch on it at, br- briefly. But we're going to talk about him re, uh, rebooting uh, Martyr. And we're going to talk about uh, these albums here. We're going to get into these four albums here, the Martyr catalog. 
which if you don't know Martyr, get with it and check it out because it's fucking killer. The killer, killer stuff. Dan is a sick, sick fucking guitar player. And uh, he's been on before, so he's going to be in... Uh, He's going to be in on Sunday night at 7.30. Uh, into next week, I'm not sure what's going on. A lot's going to depend on my health. But we're also going to also have uh, Derek Vela from Two Molds going to stop by. We're going to talk about the new album. I'm trying to coax him into getting Payson and uh, Max on. And then also Don Anderson from Agaloc is coming in at the end of the month. I'm hoping to get Jean and maybe some of the other guys in the band in. So back to Paul. Paul is back here with us. How's there it going? you go for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'm good. Man. I'm all, all good. Right, I, and first of all, I really want to thank you so much for giving me so much of your time today. Oh, of uh, course, man. Super appreciate it. And uh, you're a beautiful human being. So, uh, real quick question for you. Uh, we'll get. Uh, we'll do it real quick. We'll go. We'll get. We'll get Paul reengaged here by asking, "What's your favorite Star Wars prop or peach, piece of oh. merch that you have?" This could be like <laughs> a half an hour, Nate. Man, dude, you have, I, I, yeah. Oh God. Um, I wish I had more of a mobile thing to show you. Uh, my favorite, <sighs> probably my Mark Hamill autograph. Ah, nice. Uh, Did yeah. Did you meet him? Did you meet him? Uh, not, not in person. Okay. Not in person. I, I got, yeah, I, I can't, uh, unfortunately I can't, I can't really talk about how I got it. Um, okay. All right. I was asked not to from somebody, so I, okay, I have to gotcha, honor that. Gotcha. That's pretty uh, badass. That's cool. I have, yeah. Uh, I was just talking to my friend Diana uh, this morning. Uh, she's Morgan Elsbeth on Ahsoka. Okay. So the the last episode was last night, and so yeah, I've, I've got friends in it. But my favorite props, I I I have so many autographs and helmets, and I've got like twenty five lightsabers and no way. Damn, dude, you're like hardcore. Uh, yeah, you probably can't see it. No, you can't. Ah, uh, shit. Let's see. Uh, so yeah, I've got this laptop up. Go that ahead. table. That that table is uh. That's all lightsabers that you can see. Yeah, let me blow you up. Hold on one sec. Yeah. Let me blow you up. Oh wow. So that's that's all lightsabers. That's all helmets. I've made like half of those. Now is this your man cave or is this your studio or what? What's the deal? Uh no, this is just my basement. <laughs> Oh, that's your basement. Okay. Yeah. This is just nice. like our living room. It's just our living room basement area. My wife it's, is uh it's your basement shrine to uh to all things uh 1977, right? And beyond. Uh yeah, mostly one side of the room is like music and uh my wife has a lot of autograph vinyl and stuff like that on the one wall and then the other side is all Star Wars cuz she's she's into nice. it like I am. So, yeah, it's, oh, it's she's cool. a, she's a nerd, a Star Wars nerd like you? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay cool yeah which helps cool um so we're at we're at kind of you know th where i'm unfortunately i'm not able to show anything because after that we've got uh bled white we've got uh hamardia we've got nef uh, i'm sorry nephilim yep nephilim grove right nephilim grove that's the newest so, one let me ask you this uh and the last one was 2019 if i'm not wrong correct or was it that's correct okay so let me ask you this as you're moving along now through the teens and approaching the 20s is it getting more difficult for you guys as a band to to come up with material to create um and i gather in some respect you know you're you have a label you're with prophecy right when did you go with prophecy when was that it was before. It was just before uh, Nephilim. So 20, 2016, 2017, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was I hate to ask because I didn't do my research on these last three albums because I don't own them. But Amartya, Blood White, were they? Who were they still through? Was that through? Not through the end anymore, right? No, they were. They they were through. Well, they uh, were through the end. <laughs> God, I can't. I can't believe I don't know this about you. We got so many damn albums. Uh, yes, I believe they were both through the end. That Let is, me pull yes. this up here a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost positive they were. Uh, Nephilim Grove was our first yep. album through Blood, Prophecy. Yes. Yeah, Blood White was on. Yep, they were both on there. Right. So, um, and that's kind of an interesting story unto itself because the end 
starts as this kind of almost one man operation in, in California, moves to Salt Lake city. Andreas starts to really take on a lot of things. I mean, there's, you know, Opeth kind of comes in there dissection. There's all kind of really a lot of varied artists that start to, to go to the end because of that non giant mega label thing that, you know, the one that wants to control every element of your career and on, um, to an extent, and maybe you can speak more to it than I can, obviously, the end kind of ends up being bought out by BMG. And it moves to New York City, and it kind of becomes, I don't know, did it become what it wasn't originally? If you get my, if you get my question. I, I have to. <sighs> so. You have, you have to defer from answering that. Legally, okay, I, can't, yeah, yeah. I, I can't say anything about it. Right. Anything. Okay. Okay. So I, 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 we, everything was fine at the end records. Okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, but it is worth noting that if you know anything about the end records, it changed uh, pretty dramatically. And uh, yes, it did. Clearly money became a big factor and you can't, you can't fault maybe Andreas for moving in the direction that it had to move. Maybe it was just, the way it had to go, right? I think Andreas had the best intentions for everybody. And I think there were, again, opinion. Uh, I think there were, there were deals made with larger entities yep. that may have pushed the label in directions it didn't necessarily agree to go with but did and it ended up being the wrong decision for everybody yeah. in the end yeah and yeah, uh yeah. he's I out mean, he's out now right he's out of it as far as i know as, yeah. as far as i know yeah I, I don't know i i don't speak with andreas much anymore and i okay. i don't know what he's got up to in his life but uh i wish okay. him the best i mean yeah right. I, I i don't have anything negative to say about him well i mean they were kind of instrumental in moving you guys along i would say or moving, uh, maybe not moving you along, but in elevating the profile, let's put it that way. I would definitely say that. I, I think uh, even Dark Symphonies that we were on before the end records uh, did a lot for us at the time. Um, helped helped get us noted. And I mean, that was the label that got us in stuff like Metal Maniacs and, and things like that. So I, I think every, every place we've been, every every label all of that i think is uh I, I won't call it stepping stone that sounds so shitty. yeah um they, they're all chapters in in the book that's november's doom and as you you go through the chapter to chapter to chapter we we are elevated each more with with each each people we align ourselves with so right. we've always tried to make the best partnerships we could with whoever we were working with um so I guess we get to, you know, I, I, and I don't need mean to skip over Bled White and, and Hamartia. I've heard the albums. I know I don't know them like I know. Oh, understood. It's fine. And I, and I don't, please take that. I think you as an artist understand that as a music collector, as a music guy. There's a lot. Squirrel, squirrel, <laughs> squirrel, squirrel, right? right? right. And, and that's kind of how it is because. I'm not just a metal dude. I'm a jazz guy. I'm a fucking oh, electronic yeah. guy. I kind of move all throughout different genres. And if you know people that watch my channel know that, and I think that's why my channel hasn't exploded quicker because I'm not just focusing on one genre because I can't do that as a human being. I need, you know, I need some uh, early Bee Gees sometimes. I need some Aphex Twins sometimes. I need some Opeth and some. November's doom and enslaved. And that's just who I am as, as a guy. And so I, I hear you, man. I, I don't listen to much metal. <laughs> yeah. That's, I hear that so much from metal guys. It's like, I don't really listen that much metal. I'll be like, so what are you listening to these days? Dude, I don't really buy any metal anymore. It's like the, the dirty secret of the metal community. It's like, yeah, I'm kind of, kind of burning. I, let's be honest, man. In today's day and age with digital recording and digital workstations and, Dr modern drummer or whatever it's called perfect drummer oh, yeah. and plugins and all that shit you do not have to be the greatest musician to write 
songs and you don't you there's so much out there paul it's just you're inundated with it i'm overwhelmed with it a lot and i'm like yeah yeah i've heard nine million bands that sound like november's doom why do i need to listen to them when i can just go listen to november's doom that's three hours i I feel the same way about a lot of autopsy clones do i need when i can just go fucking listen to autopsy right okay but playing devil's advocate here there are take 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 a death metal band like gate creeper mm-hmm. right now good band gate, gate creeper in my opinion is doing old school classic death metal mm-hmm. better than some of the classic death metal bands did oh for sure yeah i mean there are exceptions to every rule and i agree of with course. you but there are some bands that come out and i'm like oh my god yeah they're just they blow me away and gate creepers one of them holy yeah god. buddy what of mine a- a buddy of mine, Tom Draper, he's in Spirit of Drift. Do you know Spirit of Drift? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Nate. And I had never really, I knew about him, but I never really checked him out. He's like, dude, you got to check these guys, you got to check this song out. I listen, I'm like, fucking hey, dude. It's like all the best parts of Sabbath and Thin Lizzy and, yeah. you know, those bands that are so right here to me, right? That, yeah, yeah, right, like, right. Yeah, I, it's great. Their new album's really fucking good. You're right. I don't shut everything out. It's just, the new two mold, fantastic, man. Fucking fantastic. You know, it's kind of like the best parts of Cynic and Atheist. And I'm, you know, I love Cynic and I love Atheist. Kelly and I are, are bros, and Paul and I recently kind of hung out, and he's just a beautiful soul, you know. And it's like, man, you know, so it's great that new bands are carrying the torch, moving things forward. These younger cats, you know, younger than old dudes like us, that, you know, we're, we're going to, the reality of it is we're coming to the end of the road cl- sooner than we're at the beginning of it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a point in where the torch has to be carried, but I do think that the market is overly saturated with too much. So it's hard to, it's hard if you have ADHD, ADHD, like I do to, so do I exactly. It's hard to go down those roads. Right. Because you're like, once the rabbit hole opens, I've had it happen where I get on Bandcamp where four hours is gone. I'm like, fuck, I didn't do a thing today, but chase down all these different bands and spend a lot of money that I don't even have, you know? Yeah, um, man, I, I get you. I, I It's funny. You brought that up earlier and you started talking about uh, medication for that stuff. I, I literally just started my regimen uh, this week. <laughs> oh, really? See, I uh-huh. don't. I, I won't go down that road for me. That's a personal choice for me. I'd we'll, rather we'll talk. Just- we'll talk off the air. Yeah, we'll talk out the air about that. But um, so what is going on now currently with the band? Because you dropped a little hint that the things are the machine's starting to roll. Oh, yeah. And I mean obviously over COVID, you didn't have any opportunities to do much of anything. It was two years where everybody was isolated. Yeah, we we just kind of like just shut in and did nothing. down. Were the guys writing riffs and sending it to you and no, I, I think no. I think at least for the first year, no one knew what the hell was going to happen with anything. So everyone mm-hmm. just kind of waited it out. And then I think by the time we started thinking about it again, no one was feeling motivated to write or do anything at that time. So I think uh, now we're to the point where I think there's enough riffs and the guys have enough material now that we can probably start to form like the full album um so we're getting we're getting close i mean we can you guys all live in the same area paul close enough yeah we meet once a week for rehearsal yeah okay so you do actually rehearse so it's not necessarily a file sharing separate sort of situation like some bands no right guys guys right at home bring it into rehearsal, play it for everybody. We try to put stuff together, see how it goes. And then like, there'll be a lot of times Vito will come in and be like, guys, I, I got like two riffs that he'll play. And then hear. Larry will go, Oh, let me take those home, man. I got something. I think I can work with that. I might have to retweak him. A li-. And then he'll Larry will come back the next week with his stuff added. And we're like, Oh, that's great. Let's, let's do this. And it just, it, it, it comes together really, uh, uh, organically and, and naturally so predominantly way. Vito and, and, and Larry that kind of start the, the, the skeletal framework of a lot of stuff. They write, they write all of it. They write okay. it, as far as music goes, as far as the riffs, that is almost 100% Larry and Vito. Okay. 
and I don't want to denigrate or or skip over uh, mention your bass player and drummer too because uh, and and their relationship to all this because you've had the bass seat has always kind of been sort of fluid for you guys for quite a while and then it, I think it's been pretty consistent now for a while right we've we've uh, had a consistent lineup for about ten years now so yeah we haven't made a change in three albums which is. We have never had two albums in a row without a new member, and now we we're finally to that place where these last uh, three is it or last last three? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and who's your drummer? I'm sorry, I should know it, but I didn't look it up. Gary Naples. Gary, and he's been because you had Joe was with you for a very long time, right? Joe was with us for a while. Uh, Gary Gary's been with us since. Uh, Jesus, the first thing Gary ever did is he he joined us and filmed the video for Harvest Scythe. So he's not on a photic. He's on the next album on. So he's been with okay. us since. Yeah, I was going to say I thought it was a, a photic. Um, but he's – um, and again, you guys are all family guys. Yeah. I, I imagine the other guys in the band all work some sort of day job or night job or whatever, right? I mean – because you're yeah. not live, you're not living off of no, November's doom, right? No, not at all. No, everyone, yeah. everyone's got their their day jobs for sure. Um, if uh, it's if my wife you, there, uh, plug in the uh, the show we have coming up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say you have a show coming up uh, the twenty eighth. So it's looming. Uh, it local me. show. What is what is the uh, heavy Chicago? What is that? Uh, it's it's going to be a two weekend festival at a club here called Avondale, and it is a, a fairly new, real nice club in Chicago. So that night we are playing uh, Trouble headlines. Okay, uh, who's singing Vaughn. for Trouble? Is it Kyle? Yeah, it's Kyle. Oh, it's Kyle. Okay, all right. I wasn't uh, sure. Yeah, so it's it's Trouble, uh, Bongzilla. Stoner, God, I, stoner band. Yeah, I'm so bad. Uh, uh, somebody else in us, and and I. Uh, Somebody in the chat will put it up. Yeah, man, I, I'm so bad. I, my memory shot. I have such a bad memory. Oh, uh, I'm like that too, dude. It's it's age and wear and tear on the on the uh, on the synapses, man. Um, I said I, I can't I can't remember like my own lyrics for shit. I can't I can't I just cannot remember. Well, okay, that's stuff. a great thing. A great question. What do you do to prep for that? Are you using a? I have an iPad use, on stage. <laughs> oh, you got an iPad now. Okay. I got a what big you- iPad and I have it down by my feet and I just, you know what it is? I, I don't need to like stare and read line for line. I get lost and I'm like, just uh, need cues. You and I look down, cues. I got the first couple words. Okay. I know that verse, you know, right. it, it's just, I need a little memory every now and then to let me know where I'm at. Well, it's kind of crazy you bring that up because you start. I'm starting to see it now with Halford and Bruce isn't doing it because he's moving too much. Bruce is like a fucking a tornado of everything, right? You know, but but a lot of artists are doing it, so it's not like I saw Behemoth. I didn't see them personally; they were here recently. But I saw Nurgle was has a big fucking you know one of the big consoles, almost like a TV screen down below him. But I was talking to Chris Contos. He's like, "Yeah, dude, but they have so many cue points for pyro and for all yeah, the right, you know, right, all right. that stuff that he almost kind of, almost kind of needs it." You know, I mean, um, so you know that is an interesting sort of thing because you think to yourself, "Well, 15 years ago, you didn't need that." You know what I mean? But then again, you only had the same seven or eight songs that you were playing. Right now, you're like, it's you know, funny. You, I could go back and we can do like a song off of mid our first album. And I, every word comes back to me. No problem. It's like the, it's more the short term, stuff. not the long. It's more of the yeah. short term shit, not the long term shit. Right. 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 And you know, that's the ADHD dude. I'm for sure me, it is. I'm for sure. Me, it I'm is. absolutely sure it is. I cannot like focus on it. And, and, and here's my brain. We'll get on stage. This, this happened to me in Germany at the, at the bell, the cave show. I think I even brought it up to the crowd. I'll get out there. We'll start performing. And if I look down and I see a bunch of people singing along because they know the words, it freaks me out. And in my mind, I start going, am I saying the right thing? (laughs) Oh, fuck. They know the words. If if I make a mistake, they're going to know I'm going to look like an idiot. And that's where my brain starts to trail off. And I I like I get in my own head and start to freak out and go, oh, fuck, look down. Where am I? Yeah, it's it, it sucks having a million things going on at one time that you, you can't keep straight. I knew I, I feel you brother. Um, do you suffer from stage fright at all? 
No, never, 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 never. never. Had a problem I, with it? I, maybe like I, the first Way show back. we ever did. Yeah, I was didn't know what to expect, or maybe like the first time you you walk out behind the curtain at like a twenty thousand person festival, like Grass Pop or something, and then you're like, holy shit! Yeah, I mean there there are like a couple the moments. moments. But as soon as you like hit it and you 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 like take command of that stage, that's it. It's just like just, I, I'm, I'm at home. I'm comfortable. Yeah, you're like a torpedo. Right, yeah. you know, just sort of moving, and and I gotta say, like, what is the biggest festival you've done? Grass pop or Vakin or what? Well, Vakin's a bucket list. We have not, we have not, we've not been done, there. Okay, not yet, not yet. Grass pop. We've done grass pop a couple of times. Uh, brutal assault a couple of times. Yeah, there's there's been several over there that are just. Is I it mean, easier to play in front of a giant crowd than a small one? Oh, I love them both. See, that's a good question, but I, I get, I get different reward out of both of them. I love, I love a tight packed club where everyone's just right there and the energy's there and that that's a great, great feeling. But also I find it challenging on a big stage like that at a festival because I walk out and I look at and I go, okay, I got to, I, it, it's not just for like the diehards in front. I got to get, yeah. I got to get all, I got to engage everybody. You got to try to get somebody in the back back there to kind of give you feedback. Right. And, and Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden was the greatest one. I, I, I just remember hearing him say that years ago, like I want the guy in the furthest seat all the way in the back. And I'm like, hell yes, man. That's, I mean, that's important. Yeah. That's even in, in Belve when we just played, like they had, people can line up and watch you from the sides of the stage, which was weird. And I was like, I've seen no band like interact with these people. I'm like, fuck it. I am. So I was running side to side. Like it was fun. I had a great time. How many people were at that show? Do you have an idea? I think it, it, the cave only holds like 2000. Like it's, it's not 2, like a huge festival, but yeah. 2000 people in that cave. It's packed. a lot. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. If anybody hasn't seen that, Paul has pictures on the November's doom facebook man it's so cool and there's some video i think of you talking too um yeah yeah it's uh, a wicked fucking thing and i mean man agalock regroups and i think they headlined it right uh one of the days they did yeah yeah and that was really big i mean i remember don and i had an interview last november and i'm like do you think you guys will ever come little did i know it was already things were already starting to inch that direction already you know yeah yeah really 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 cool um what so what do you got coming up? Do you do you, you think you're gonna you got this show in October? Is that the only thing you got booked right now? Uh, the yeah, the only thing we have officially booked is the show in October. I know we are really starting to really shift that focus into this material that we have now to actually the, the original plan uh, was we were gonna come home from this trip in Europe that we just got back from and try to book time and go into the studio in October, but we're not, we're not quite there yet. So we're now, I, I'm hoping we'll get together with the band. Larry and I'll get together and we'll discuss where things are going to go. And then with luck, we'll be in the studio February and then we'll see how long it takes from there. Now your big holdup is after we turn in masters, you have to wait for the vinyl, vinal pressing. And that's and like 12 and, months off. Yeah. It's the, the weight is insane right now. So yeah. I'm hoping that comes down because I don't want to wait a year. <laughs> I think it has started to slowly recede as far as the, that crazy, you know, like 12, 14 month lead time. I I've been hearing that it's kind of coming down, but that does really affect everyone that's in the game because you, you, because vinyls becoming a big part of, Thankfully, again, although I hate to say that, I'm not, I came from the vinyl generation. I respect it. I love seeing cool stuff, but I'm really a, you know, a CD guy. Like, for example, I just grabbed this, right? 20, oh, yeah. 20 CD box set of Vandergraaff. Nice. I, I would, I wouldn't be able to afford a fucking vinyl copy of it. I just can't. Uh, I know. I know. I can't do it or, or Hawkwind box set I just got. So, for me, it works better. The format works. It's more, it's more portable. But I get it. It's cool to see young kids getting into vinyl and. But and statistically, kind of, statistically, eighty-five percent of vinyl doesn't even get opened today. I heard you talk about that, and that blows my mind, dude. Eighty-five like, percent of vinyl doesn't even get opened. 
So what are they doing with it? They're they're sitting on it to resell it. If they you're going, if you're going to collect something from a band, why not collect the big, beautiful piece of artwork instead mm -hmm. of the small version? I mean, because think about it. Unless you're an audiophile or you have a record player and you really love, you know, most people are not going to come home and put a record on. And I say that, and I, I know there's going to be people like, well, I do, of course, of course, of course, of course you do. A lot of people do, but but the, the higher majority, percentage of people don't do it. The majority of people, yeah, yep. It's easier to stream music. It's more convenient to just stream your music. So it's not even like people are buying CDs and listening to those CDs. Right. If you buy a CD, you'll get it. You'll rip it to your computer, throw it to your phone, or stream it and and move on. So if you're yeah, I mean, a lot of cars, band, a lot of cars they don't even have CD players anymore. Right. That's the telling thing. They don't even have the machinery for it anymore to to re reproduce it You're, it's all bluetooth and i don't like that man i'm just gonna i'm gonna go old man screaming at the clouds i just don't like that shit man Bust <laughs> the fuck out of me you know what i mean and but it is cool to see the vinyl coming back but like you said i have a bunch of vinyl here but i i never play it because it's much simpler to do this or Absolutely. whatever i whatever. i like i've always embraced technology and moving forward and mp3s and vinyl and cds i i will support the bands but i buy their albums digitally i don't uh i don't even buy i don't want physical heavy ass shit i gotta move around or someone's got to take care of after i die <laughs> just, well that's another good point like you know, I, i'd rather put that money into like the star wars shit that i have behind me than, than right. you know what i mean you found other places to to siphon that disposable income i mean i get it dude i i, I battle that thing in my brain all the time it's like because of my illness, I was able to start scaling back because I'm going yeah, on yeah. I'm going on disability soon, unfortunately, because that's where this is headed for me. And I understand. And so I I had to go, okay, you can't spend a thousand dollars a month disposable income on all this shit that my kids are gonna have to figure out what to do with at some point. Right. You know, that that's the reality. Yeah. So the responsible person says, I'm gonna stop the ADHD. Oh, look, there's another box set from one of my favorite bands. Got to own it. That guy goes, I got to own it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I Man, I, I, I tell you, I'm the same. Like my kid, not only is she going to have to deal with Star Wars, but my attic is full of, I, I've collected Spider-Man stuff since I was like three years old. No way. <laughs> so I have an attic of 30, 40 boxes of toys still in packages and and I, I, anything you oh. can imagine i have so i have every figure from the 90s still in the packages do you really oh yes. you see so you're you're hardcore dude right i uh, yeah i gotta i gotta like I, I gotta curb myself with certain things now it's just like i i was collecting the black series figures and i'm like i the star wars i'm like i can't i i just i can't it, it's yeah. ridiculous so i said no more toys i'm going to put it into the higher end collectibles it's dude it's it, I, and i say this with all sincerity it's an illness it's an oh illness. i i believe that i i know i i my passions are weird wait i'll show you how stupid this gets for me so uh all right he was asking what my favorite piece was right okay mm -hmm. so that would probably go, be uh let's see that is the all right, here you go. This this is probably if I had to pick one piece, that's my favorite. It would be Luke's lightsaber from Return of the Jedi, the hero version. Now, is and, that a uh, real prop or is that just a, a repro? They're they're all repros. I mean, but okay. they they have this is not like official from Disney or anything like okay. that. Um, this is uh, I'm gonna blow you up. Yeah, yeah. This is milled. Um, so I have, I've got, I've made friends. So, I mean, this thing goes all the way down oh, to the, shit. look at like, that thing, man. Is that a lithium battery in there or what? Yeah. Yeah. So wow. that locks in. My battery dead. Don't die on me. Don't do that. I am a Jedi. Like my father before me. Oh, all shit. Right. It's got, it's got dialogue in it. Yeah, hold on. This thing is this thing is sick. Now, does it so, turn on? Like, I gotta see this, man. I could put a blade in it. It does. Uh, oh 
Oh shit! It gives you that. Oh my god. Yeah, it does. Now what? What actually uh, goes inside the? the is there a light blade or what is it? Yeah, you could put a you could put a, a blade in the top. Give me a second. Okay. I think my battery in it is. Uh... That's insane, dude. So even the inside has got. Yeah. It's got a crystal in there, and that crystal is moldavite, which comes from an actual uh, meteor. <laughs> wow. So yeah, where I've got. Get, where did you get that at, Paul? Uh, Ukraine. It's the only place you can get it. It's in the Ukraine. It's the only place where this thing crashed and, uh, the heat from it had created this green glass and it's like, a. is that where they made that, that toy? No, no, this where was, is, where was the lightsaber all that assembled? I had it making too much noise and I can't get the light to it. I think my battery's half dead in this. Okay. I think that's the problem, but, uh, so it comes from all over. Uh, the actual hilt itself is from a company called uh, Seven Chambers. Okay. Um, and this is created to be as close to movie quality as possible. That's what I, I, I like right. the, the, the high end like prop material. So, I mean, it even has the reveal on the inside. Like, do you, do you want to, do you want to reveal how much you paid for that? No. no? Okay. <laughs> so no, I mean, all in all, too you much. can too much, but if you're lucky, you can probably get this for like eight hundred. Wow! <laughs> if you're not lucky, like twelve hundred. Wow! Holy shit! Yeah, and I. Holy fuck, man! I didn't. I didn't pay that much. Okay, all right. I didn't. I didn't pay that much. Uh, but yeah, That's insane, so, man. Do you have That's so badass? Yeah, I have two Vader helmets. I have I have one over here, and then I have one. Uh, you can't see him right there in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> right. kind of. Yeah, you can kind of yeah. see it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I do have Vader. That's awesome, man. That you are a hardcore, dude. Uh, man, you. I, well, I have a. I, I basically I make props, so I I do. Uh, it serves another purpose for me as well. You made your own stuff, in other words. Oh yeah, a lot of these helmets I made. Oh really? Yeah. Out so that's of, like what? Like it's Anchor Head Rebels. That's uh, it's uh, I, I make props and stuff like that. Oh wait, say that again. The company it's called Anchor Head Rebels, and uh, yeah, we make uh Star Wars props. Okay, now is that your company or just someone you work for or what? Uh, yeah, me and the wife. Okay, I will. Um, you gotta send me that. Do you have a link? Yeah, Etsy page. You can check out uh, anchorheadrebels.com or Anchorhead Market on Etsy. We do yeah, laser send me the link and I'll add that into the description then. Um, awesome, man. Thank one you. One other thing I wanted to ask you about, and we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Um, yep. The the November's Doom website, do you have a website right now or is it just a Facebook page? Yeah, I did. And, and you know, it was kind of one of those things where I'm paying every month for this website that no one ever goes to. So I just took the name. I own the name and I link it right to the Facebook page for now. I will eventually do okay. something with it. That's but. what I wondered because I was yeah. hunting around. You did have one and I remember going to it years ago, but you know, I, I, again, the ADHD thing, I mean, you know, no one of, updated it anymore. We all just right. kind of let it sit. It was like, what, why are we, I mean, we're not right. even using it. No one uses yeah. this stuff like they used to. So yeah, it's I funny. mean, the first place I, if I go to research a band, I check Facebook first, you know, I don't even look for a web page anymore. Yeah, I I it's funny, dude. I I only reluctantly started a Facebook page back in December and kind of disappointed, man. Nobody goes to it and like nobody's really utilizing it, but I use Instagram mainly to kind of to to promote this thing and just simply doing what I do and hoping that people share it and 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 you know, that kind of stuff. So it's very cool like I noted that you shared this on the Facebook page and like 20 oh, yeah. or so people were like into it, but I've noticed other guys that I've dealt with have not even shared some of the videos. I'm like, you know, and then I don't want to go back to them and go, is there something I did wrong or what's the deal? And then like with yeah, Kelly, yeah. I'm like, dude, Kelly, I'm like, dude, we've done like three interviews. What the fuck, man? What's going on? He's like, oh, I, I keep forgetting. I'm like, well, thanks. That doesn't help me much. Yeah. You know, I'd like you to, I'd like these things to be seen, but um, so you, you figure maybe we're looking at a 25 release potentially then we're uh, of course we're hoping by the end of next year, but uh, I, 
God, with delays and everything, I don't know if that's going to quite happen. So yeah, I, all I can tell you is it is in the works. It will happen. And hopefully it will be, we're going to do everything we can to make it sooner than later. What, when you're in the studio, like generally how fast is the process? Do, do you, do the guys come in with the riffs and already have demos of them? Or are you, do you all demo together? Or you don't even, do you just skip the demo phase and go right to let's record? No, no, we, we demo everything we demo, but we demo kind of like on our own that that's where things like, okay, Gary's going to lay down the drums, a, a live room drum track to some scratch track. And then Vito's going to take that. He's going to put it in his DAW and then he's going to run his guitars and it'll go to Larry. Larry will do the same thing. Eventually it gets to me and I can start writing my melodies and harmonies and, and phrasing and stuff like that for vocals. Like when you, when you do your vocals, do you do full, for the demos, do you do full on takes or do you often do a lot of like sort of guide stuff where you're just scat scatting stuff out? Blah, 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 blah. I can't do, do that. Have, okay. You have full I do full on stuff. takes. This is funny you say that. I My only experience to that is I, I, I write, I've written all the lyrics for Dan Swano's Witherscape. Right. And, and Dan does exactly what you're saying. He sends me the demos of the Witherscape albums and it's all just nonsense words. He's coming up. No, he's using actual words. Oh, like he is. Okay, but, right. but, but it, so when he comes to me and he writes the melodies and his harmonies, and all this stuff, and he comes, he goes, okay, this song, I need about this, this subject. And I need you to write it where you're matching all my syllables and phrasing Oh shit. And, and and rhyme the words at the end of the lines. And I'm going, that's not easy. Holy shit. No, it's some of the most challenging stuff I've ever done. He's re and it, it comes out amazing, but it got to the point where I'm like, okay, Dan, you want me to rhyme the ends of everything? Okay. But please stop using the word fire at the end of every <laughs> because there's only so many there's things so many that words I can go rhyme there, right? with fire. It's just fire. it's a common thing, so he just keeps repeating it in his pen. I'm like, dude, I, I got to change this. <laughs> yeah, higher, pyre, wire, wire. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm, already, wire. I'm out right there. I'm out. Yeah. No. Um, so for me, I'll either I'll either I'll, I'll write lyrics without music and then I'll place it to the song I feel it fits or I'll hear music and, and get an idea and go, ah, I know what I got to write about that one. So it, it can go either way for me. I'm glad you brought that up because that was in my notes and I skipped over. Talk about Dan and how that kind of came together, because now, again, not to bring up Opeth again, but but there was that connection in that, you know, he was very instrumental in their early album, first three albums doing all Dan, the production, right? And Dan and so, was in touch. Yeah. We, we, it, the question came up earlier about Dead Serenade. And he was in contact with those guys in Dead Serenade way back, way, 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 way back. So Pale Haunt was coming out or, or we were getting ready to do Pale Haunt and we had, we, we were not happy with the way everything happened with To Welcome the Fade. We wanted to go a different route. We And his name came up. And I said, well, I had talked to him years ago through this. Let me reach out and see. And at that time, Dan had retired from music. He wasn't doing mixing, mastering. He was out of the game completely. Really? Yeah. I didn't so know I, went, okay. I, I went to him and convinced him to come out of retirement to do Pale Haunt. And he, he did. And uh, here he still is. He's still doing I, I So, And he sees, he's given me credit in an interview before, too, saying that I, I – like I'm the one who pulled him back into this. So. Threw him back in. Yeah. Hey man, and I'm so glad that that I did because he is masterful at, at what he does. Stupid oh my god, a guy, man! Just as a writer, as a singer, as a and you know, it's interesting. We brought up the 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 anxiety thing. I'm pretty sure I've read interviews. Read, believe it or not, I used to read. Um, <laughs> I read interviews where he talked about where he's had a lot. He's fought a lot of anxiety issues with being on stage and performing because he stopped i'm not wrong about this he stopped performing quite a long time ago right yep yep and i think it was due to that i think i i don't know exactly the reasons uh i do know that we played in belgium and brought in nightingale with us so i i did get to play with him one time mm -hmm. um it was dan is dan is uh 
an, an amazing and and very warm human being. I uh, yeah, we love Dan. I, I've and heard I, that I'd, man. Yeah, he's great. He is absolutely great. Does he still do? Does he still do interviews? You know? No idea. I have no idea. Well, we got to no talk. Idea. We got to talk privately then. I think you know where okay. I'm going with this. But um, okay. Um, yeah, man. So let everybody. I'm going to let you go because I've had you all on this for three hours, and I I can not thank you enough for for doing all this. Um, I hope it was not too unpleasant an experience for you, Paul. Dude, I I've enjoyed every second of it. Um, tell me what you foresee for November's doom. Did you want to talk about any of your other projects or are they all kind of asleep and dormant now? Like, uh, like these are they and M, M Symphonia, which I gotta be honest with you, dude, I don't know much about. They, all those that kind of in the past. M, M Symphonia was a project I, I did with uh, Brian Griffin from broken hope. He's now, he's now the, uh, the tour manager and, and sound man for Lamb of God. Okay. Um, now that was, that was never anything other than the EP. Uh, these are, they was my original guitarist, Steve from November's doom came back. He wanted to do music again. I'm like, I don't have a spot for you in doom so we can start something new. We started that album. Um, we, we had three albums and like two EPs and like less than three years. We, we were like blasting through music on that. And then, uh, two of the band members are no longer alive. So it's, uh, yeah, just just uh, kind of. I gotta sad. check that stuff out. Is what that come out on? Uh, it, the End Records put it out under okay. under a sister label of theirs called Unruly Sounds. Okay, okay, but yeah, I don't know. It's on Spotify. That's I'll uh, have to at, check that out and see what uh, what's going on there. Is that that's more straight ahead death metal or what? What would you? It's call like old it? school death metal. Yeah, it's okay. it's. I mean, the original guitar player for November's Doom and myself are do, so it, it there. You will find similarities on there. A lot of doom. A lot of doom. It's more mid paced death metal. Okay. Cool. So cool. it's, it's um, more like yeah. So we want to get people traffic to your your socials. We got Facebook up there. I've got the Bandcamp up there. Um, I quickly went through there's vinyl i think available on Bandcamp, from what i can tell of some of the more recent albums um i missed out on the uh the book editions of was it nephilim and yeah yeah, yeah those kind of went fairly quickly i believe which is a good thing um which kind of bummer because i i just saw the, them they, they were selling them in the cave our label so i think they might still have some wait say where now I, they had a, the, our label was selling uh, in Belf at the cave. They had some of the box sets. Oh, they did? Yeah. Wait, who's your label? Oh, oh, Prophecy. Prophecy. Yeah. Prophecy. Okay. Maybe I noticed they were out, they were out on Bandcamp. So I'll have to check Prophecy. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, check that out. Check out Anchor, say again, Anchorhead, right? Anchorhead Rebels. <laughs> yeah. You need to send me that link so I can I'll link do that. it in the description there. And, um, Paul, dude, hang on a second. Any questions quick before Paul Jets here? The poor guy is probably like, hey, Nate, a thank you. Go ahead. Nate, I just said I'm reading that. I, I just I just realized there's a chat. <laughs> yeah, he's he's down below there. Um, yeah, thanks, Paul. Best wishes for your daughter and dog, and best of luck. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been great. Thanks for being here, Laps Now We've had upwards of 15 people, dude, which in the middle of uh, an afternoon, for a fraud, that's pretty good. I mean, yeah. that's how I look at it. I mean, two frauds. I'll, I'll jump in, too. I'll be a fraud as well. That's a pretty good uh, – to me, that's a good afternoon stream. So a lot Amen. of my buddies are in here. I appreciate guys like Johnny Mac being here and Nate being in here and Devin and uh, who else do we have? Noel, I don't know you. Noel's my you. wife. Oh, that's your okay. That's your wife. Okay, Noel is my wife. Noel, yeah, I thought it was Noel the, the the dude's name. No, Noel. So. No, yeah, she gets that a lot, but no, it's it's more like the uh, the, the Christmas thing. <laughs> gotcha. So we got Acid King in trouble. Bongzilla, November's Doom. That's who's at uh, she, uh, what's it called again? Heavy that's Chicago. Avondale, yeah, Heavy Chicago Fest. Okay. It's at the Avondale Nightclub. On uh, we are playing October twenty eighth, and we go on first. Why? Because my cousin's getting married that night, so I oh, have you to gotta like, get out of there. I gotta perform, shower, and run to the, the venue for a wedding. So nice, nice. <laughs> Sorry, um, I won't be sticking around after. 
Laser Metallion, I don't know you. Paul's a super cool guy. Got to meet him at MDF. Rest of the band as well. Yeah, I've, I mean, there isn't enough interviews of you guys out there. That's why when I got this idea, I'm like, I got to reach out to Paul and see if he'll jump on with me because there's really not that much out there. And I so appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we get some traffic your way. Phil, anybody else here? Let me see. I don't want to, I don't want to blow people out that we're in that we're here. I'm sure Ben was here earlier. I'm sure that. Paul really appreciates all you guys being here and the support and uh, oh, hell yeah. love. So, all right, Paul, hang loose for me one second. I'm going to end you got real it. quick and we're going to Sounds good. So, all right, guys, peace out, everybody. Thanks, Next everybody. Call.